alcohol, please. Beer. Beer. Goods. Carlson. Beer. Dingfelder. Beer. Citro. Citro. Beer. Miranda. Beer. Nemanja Skakel. Beer. All right, Mr. Shelby. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Members of Tampa City Council, good evening. Martin Shelby, Tampa City Council Attorney. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, this virtual meeting of the City Council of the City of Tampa has been scheduled to conduct quasi-judicial hearings and other land use matters. Today is Monday, September 21st, 2020, and this meeting is being held in accordance with the declarations and provisions of the Governor's Executive Order 20-69 and 20-193 as they may be further extended, which is subject to debate and discussion, whether it will be, but the emergency rules of procedure also as adopted and amended by the City Council. It's being conducted tonight by video teleconferencing, remote participation, which is referred to by the State of Florida statutes and rules as communications media technology. The public and the citizens of Tampa are able to watch, listen, and view this meeting on cable TV, on Spectrum and Frontier, and the internet at tampagov.net forward slash live stream, one word. Now, Council, a reminder to the public that people have been given the opportunity to participate in tonight's hearings uh, by, by pre-registering at tampagov.net slash quasi and being able to register and receive information on how to participate with a CMT device, a communications media technology device, a computer or a laptop. Now, in order to participate, the public, those members who do not have a communications media technology device can still participate by um, utilizing facilities that have been made available to the public during these hearings tonight at the Tampa Convention Center. Written material council has been provided and distributed to members of the Tampa City Council, and they have been uploaded to be available to be viewed by members of the public and the petitioners at uh, tampagov.net slash agendas, A-G-E-N-D-A-S, um, and under tonight's agenda date. Uh, council, those written comments will be received and filed and made um, a part of the record tonight. Uh, again, each public hearing is being held individually. Uh, and I turn that meeting back over now to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. If you see on the agenda, we have 13 items. However, four of those items will not be heard tonight. Items two and three um, have been withdrawn and the other two, 11 and 13, were misnoticed. So, Mr. Shelby, would I just uh, have to get a motion to remove those items? I suggest I suggest working with uh, uh, the clerk and, and um, Ms. Johnson Velez, who is present, that you go over each item individually and take them individually um, for a roll call vote, please. Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, um, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Um, yes, items two and three um, have have both been withdrawn, so those may be. Um, you may take action to remove those from the agenda. On item number 11, this is an application that has been scheduled multiple times now before City Council. Um, it was scheduled back on, uh, for to be heard on April 16th, as well as June 23rd, and then the third time for today, September 21st. And so pursuant to um, section 27-61, the, the, uh, the city ordinance, if there is a failure to perfect public notice on two or on more than two occasions, city council has the discretion to with consider those applications deemed withdrawn and to dismiss those. Um, so we've had three times now where the applicant has failed to perfect um, notice for these hearings. However, um, because of the, the COVID situation and all the continuances and things like that, um, and after um, speaking with Mr. Shelby about this, I believe what we would recommend is for council to reschedule this perhaps one more time and we allow us to reach out to the applicant and advise them that if they fail to perfect notice this final time, then their application will be deemed withdrawn and dismissed by council. Now, may I interrupt Mr. Chairman? 
for question. Should we take them in order and have council do each motion uh, separately, please? Is that possible? Mrs. Johnson Velez, would you recommend now you that you were referring last to item number 11. 11. So yes. shall we take shall we take the items go down the agenda and do the housekeeping and get those out of the way? Would you recommend that as well? Certainly. Absolutely. All right, Mr. Chairman. May I have a motion to withdraw item number or remove item number two from the agenda? Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, actually the, the, you, the correct motion would be to accept it as withdrawn. That would be it. Rather than to right. remove it. We have a motion to accept this petition, item number two, as withdrawn. Mm-hmm. Motion from Councilman Goose. Do we have a second? Second, Citro. Second from Councilman Citro. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent. Without objection, the item is withdrawn. Next up is item number three. Uh, same situation here. Uh, motion to accept it as withdrawn. Mm-hmm. Motion, second. Councilman Jones. Who is the second? Citro. Second, Councilman Citro. Any objection? Hearing none, without any objection and by unanimous consent, item number three is removed. Moving on to item number 11, which uh, has been advised that it be rescheduled to a future date. Um, let's see. Would it have to be uh, scheduled for an evening session, uh, Mr. Shelby? My recommendation where we stand now, Ms. Johnson Velez, did we say the, the December date, do you think? The December date is the one that was right. an option that we had previously talked about where they were available. And that would be December, December, December 10th at 6 p.m. 2020. That would be, that would work, Council, if that's acceptable. All right, do we have a motion for that? Motion, anybody? So we'll move, Mr. Chairman Miranda. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilmember Goods. Any roll objection? Call, please. Roll call, roll call on this continuance. All right. Roll call vote on this. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dean Felder? Yes. Manny Scacco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I just want to have a clarification on this. This is not a continuance. This is a reset because it cannot be heard because the notice had not been perfected. So if the make sure is it the intention of the maker of the motion to notify the clerk that the motion is actually to reset to that date. Is that correct, right. maker of the motion? All right. It's been verified by Councilman Miranda. It's been reset, so we'll start from scratch. Now, are there right. other are, are there other continuances that or requests? There's to, uh, one. Uh, item number thirteen is the final one. Also, uh, Miss Notice um, for Miss Johnson Velez. Do um, do we do the same and just completely reset this, or do we remove it? Well, this one has not been heard yet, Mr. Chair. Like number eleven had been previously scheduled twice. Ah, okay. This one so is this, this is the first time it's been scheduled. So it'd still be a reschedule or a reset, however you want to refer it. All right. Um, so if we get an item to reset item number 13, a motion to, to, to reset item number 13, I'm sorry. Uh, date and time of, would that be December 10th as well at 6 p.m.? I moved. Is that okay, December 10th at 6 p.m., 2020? Ms. Johnson Velez, is that a, that's a good date, is that correct? I believe that is correct. There were, previously when we had checked, there were eight item scheduled for that evening now it'd be 10. okay all right so we have a motion to reset item number 13 by councilman moran the second by councilman dinkfelder roll call vote the error yes foods yes dinkfelder yes honey stocking yes carlson yes yes and miranda yes motion carry unanimously uh, All right. One last item, Mr. Chairman, did council take up item number 10, Ms. Johnson Velez? There was a um, an issue with for that regard to that one as well. Is that correct? Uh, yes, item number 10, I completely missed that one. Um, there's a memo from Eric Cotton or an email requesting that this hearing be scheduled to a future date when council resumes regular in-person sessions. And that's per the request of the petitioner. We don't know when that's going to be, so perhaps we would schedule that one into um, into the new year. There's January. Well, these are evening sessions. I don't have the day 
calendar? Would it would it have to be voted? May, may I make a may I make a suggestion, Mr. Chairman? Sure. It appears likely as we get closer, definitely into November and into December, that the 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 odds increase that we will be going back. So my recommendation, if council wishes to go over, because we're now setting things for six o'clock anyway, instead of the 501, we can have that discussion. But my recommendation is if council wishes to go over that 10 items and to make this 11 items, we can add this to the December one rather than kick it over three months. Why not? Any objection to December 10th? So that puts us at 11 items and we'll cap it at that. We'll make a note not to do anything else December 10th at 6 p.m. Having said that, can we um, can we can we get a motion to reschedule item number ten to December tenth, twenty twenty? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes. I believe this one requires because this has already um, been properly noticed. This would be a motion to open this item and then continue the date. Use the word continue. All right. Can we get a motion to open all the public hearings? This oh, I have one through thirteen, Chairman. We have a motion to open from Councilman Miranda. Do we have a second? Second. Second from Councilman Goose. Any objection to open the hearing? All right, hearing none by no, with no objection by unanimous consent, the hearings are open. Now that the hearings are open, can we get a motion to continue item 10 until or to December 10th, 2020 at 6 p.m.? So we'll we'll move, Chairman. Chairman. We have a motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilmember Goose. Is there any objection? Uh, roll call, please, on that. Roll call. Yeah. Here. Yes. Goods. Goods. Yes. Ding Felder. Yes. Manny Stockel. Yes. Carlson. Yes. April. Yes. And Miranda. Yes. Motion carry unanimously. That settles that. Thank you very much. We'll begin with item number one. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Council members, this is a review hearing for an SU1 special use permit pursuant to- Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt. Ms. Johnson Velez, forgive me. These are quasi-judicial proceedings. Uh, so in the sense, in a lot of ways, these are held as regular evening meetings, except the Planning Commission is not gonna be present. Um, it requires the, um, the witnesses to be sworn. Each individual yes. hearing. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And this item did not receive any written comments. Okie dokie. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, Council, this is a review hearing for an SU1 special use permit pursuant to Land Development Code Section 27-61. An SU1 special use permit is one that has already been determined to be an allowed use if it meets the code criteria for that use that is found in Section 27-132 for the specific use, in this case, an extended family residence, and also if it meets the code criteria in Section 27-129, which are general standards applicable to all special use applications. Um, the, the specific criteria for an extended family residence are included in page two of your staff report. So this application did not meet the code criteria, and so staff could not approve the request because staff cannot grant waivers to those code criteria. Petitioners here are here this evening to request a waiver from you. The petitioner has the burden to prove that they meet the criteria for a waiver. This review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence upon which staff based its decision. You must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented. Staff will present the case to you and explain the waivers that are being uh, requested. And then following the hearing, council may take one of several actions on this uh, permit application. Council may approve it, approve with conditions, approve with waivers, or deny the application. If council approves with waivers, you may do so if you find that the application after granting the waivers is consistent with the applicable general standards set forth in section 27-129. I'll now turn it over to Eric Cotton. Thank you, Eric Cotton, take it away. Um, can I share my screen? I have a PowerPoint for y'all. Share my screen. There it I, is, go ahead. Is it on? Yep, I can see it. Okay, good. Um, Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. 
Um, this was a special use SU 120 13. The applicant is Jessica Meyer, her property at 3203 Yukon Street. As Susan just indicated, this is a request for an extended family residence. Um, property zoned RS 60. The proposed development, again, was an extended family residence. Um, staff denied the request. Now, there's two, there's a, a number of criteria that need to be met. In this case, the um, extended family residence, which is limited to 600 square feet, was proposed to be 840 square feet. And the allowable height for an accessory structure is 15 feet per code. This is proposed to be at um, 23.5. And the front setback, which is supposed to be 60 feet for an accessory structure, is proposed to be at 23.8. So you can see on the screen the part that's bolded in red is the proposed accessory structure and the extended family residence. Um, except for the three criteria that I just um, indicated, the request met the requirements of the code. This is on the river. Um, you see Yukon, um, 30th Street, not too far from Bush Gardens. Um, the property is the one highlighted in red. And um, this is a picture of the site the day I went out there. Um, if you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to try to answer them for you. Any questions for Mr. Cotton? Uh, I have uh, some, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, Eric, uh, does this mean that there was or there was not a permit issued to build this, this structure? I would have to check that, I've, or the applicant can respond. I believe there's a, they are, in the permitting process for the structure itself. They're coming in now to establish it as a extended family residence to put in the 220 outlet and put in the full kitchen. Well, so that, from what I am, I mean, I don't know, but I would imagine it wasn't a permit because I mean, it's not something would have happened a long time ago. Uh, I, I'm only assuming then uh, maybe I'm wrong as a city verified uh, according to the other parts of this law, I think that the extended family structure can only be built for two residents. Am I correct? Yes, sir. All right, then, uh, and those residents do not pay rent. Am I correct? That is correct. My understanding based on the application is for her, I'm not sure if it's for her or her mother and father. They both, the family lives on the property. I'm not sure who's going to be living in the extended family. And has the city of Tampa ever verified the connectivity of, uh, relationships as far as the family lineage that there are relatives yes sir she as part of her application she submitted i believe a birth certificate mm -hmm. thank you very much thank you very much any other questions from council members yes councilman dingfield thank you mr chairman um continuing along those lines uh uh mr cotton the when i look at the uh at the criteria and it it speaks to the fact that that the city allegedly checks on this annually. Yes, sir. Uh, not not obviously not necessarily hers because hers hasn't been approved yet. But somewhere I read in the in the in this provision that you know that that's the case that uh, that we have some process uh, that we go back and look at these at these S one uh, family. Uh, what do they call them? Family, uh, so yes. tell me about that a little bit uh, generically so I can have a, a greater confidence in the process. Hey, um, Pre-COVID, we didn't do the inspections this year because they're normally scheduled this time of year. We would, um, staff, staff sends out reminder letters and says everybody, this is just the time for your annual inspection. They would then schedule it. We go out and we verify who was approved under the special use and who's living on the on the property now. Um, we can't ask for ID. Most of the time, the person that normally goes out there, once you start going on these on a yearly basis, you remember the folks that live there who don't normally ask for the identification. But when there's a change, per the code, if there's a change in um, the Myers sell the property, no, they don't get, the next owner doesn't get a right to use that without going back before a special use process. So there's a whole new application. So we do check every year. Approximately, how many of these do we have? Um, I believe I would guess around thirty to thirty-five. 
Oh, that's all. Okay. And and are are people charged a fee for this annual inspection, or is this just something we do? It's something we just do. It's not. It's not. A, there's no fee involved in it. Okay. Do you recall over the last couple of years where we've come across situations where somebody's transitioned from family to renter, and we had to point out that problem to them? Actually, no. What we normally find out is the extended family is no longer needed due to family circumstances changing. And in those cases, the um, they're supposed to pull the kitchen, the ability to cook, and the 220 outlet. So you can't put a kitchen, you can't put the ability to cook back in. We do verify that portion of it. Okay. And my last question is, um, this says that uh, um, the extended family residence should be limited to a maximum of 600 square feet. Um, that wasn't part of your denial. Uh, according, I'm looking at the staff report, it says you denied it on the basis of height and setback. But but is, isn't this request 240 extra square feet as well? Yes, that was, well, yeah, the summary doesn't matter, but that was one of the, um, one of the reasons for the denial, yes. Okay, well, I've, I was just reading. I was reading the report on page one, and it doesn't it doesn't include. No, that's the, just that's just a mistake on my part. But yes, it was denied for both. It was denied for three reasons: the square okay. footage, the height, and the setback. All right, Mr. Shelby likes clean records, so I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Are there any other questions from council members, sure. Councilman Goods? Thank you. Who actually goes out and does this check? Who does the inspection? Pardon me? I'm sorry, I can't. I, you're frozen. Who actually goes out and inspects and checks to make sure they're compliance or out of compliance? Is that called the construction services? Is that no, plan development? It's, it's the zoning office. It's our office. And there's always a record kept of that in file of each time we're going out? Yes, sir. We have um, every time a special use is approved it's tagged for this extended family residence. The staff person that used to do that has since retired. She retired last in February of 2020. So we haven't done that inspection for the, because this, this is the time of year we normally do the inspections once the weather starts cooling off in October, but we're probably not gonna do the inspections this year due to COVID. All right, sir, anything else, Councilman Goods? No, that's it, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other council members? Hearing none, seeing none. Anything else, Mr. Cotton? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, we do have um, the applicant on the line who has been sworn in. If you would just please state your name and go ahead and you can speak. Okay. Hi, my name is Jessica Meyer. Thank you so much for having me. Um, the mother-in-law house will be just next to the main house. There are no trees on the land and has enough of space. The place is perfect as it is not on the water directly and it's not downhill. The setback we would like to reduce from 60 to 23.83 and the height from 15 to 23.5. Who is living there? The extended family residence may only be approved when the main resident is owner occupied and it will be as we are four generations living together uh, my grandpa, 93 years old, um, who is deaf, and we take care of him. My parents, Maria and Ronald. The daughter is me, Jessica, and my daughter, Justine, who is 16 years old. I can show you a picture here of us all living together right now. And um, as we love to live together, as we come from an Italian grandmother, uh, we help each other, and it will be our biggest wish to have the mother-in-law house next to the main house where uh, my parents would live, and there will be no charge uh, for rent, and it's only family occupied, and we are okay, you know, with a yearly control that's perfect for us as we live, you know, together. All the important requirements are otherwise all conform to the law, um, and um, the setbacks is better that it's just next to the house, as if the setback would be, you know, like on the on the law, it would be very close to the river, which would be very far downhill. 
Um, for flood reason, it is better to have the house next to the main house. Plus there are alligators in the river. Uh, but uh, yeah, in the name of my daughter, my grandpa, my parents and I, we would like you to approve this special use and so that we can all live together our full generation and have enough of space. Thank you so much. Any questions for the applicant by council members? If I may, Mr. Chair. Councilman Citro. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Is there a, a kitchen in this accessory structure? In in uh, the special use, you, you mean? Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, on the plan, there is a small kitchen in the spot and it could be changed on the plans, whatever is needed. You know. thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other council members have any questions or comments? Yes. Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ma'am, um, you might have you might have answered this already, and if I, if you did, I apologize. Mr. Miranda was inquiring earlier about did construction already did construction on this already start? And did you get did you guys get red tagged or something or what? It it's not started yet. First, we need to have your approval. And then we would ask for the permit, and then it would start. Right now, there is nothing done, so it's really empty, no trees, nothing. When I look at, when I look at the picture, it appears that that there's uh, some wood, raw wood, peeking over the back of the house. So it looks like is something under construction, or? Uh, w w which picture? <laughs> Well, the, it's the only picture I've seen on the staff report on page three. Um, Eric, can you put that up? There is maybe the deck, the deck, wood deck on the other side of the house. And maybe I'm just seeing something that, that I'm totally misconstruing. Eric, can you put up page three? Am I, am I still sharing my screen? I can't tell. You are now. Thank you. Yes. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Okay, see that? See the yellow? Yeah, the yellow I color. Know. Yes, that is finished. That project. Uh, we did a permit for um, a wood dock, like a, a dock, and this is finished already. This is already gone. This uh, thing. This that, is, has uh, nothing, that has nothing. nothing. To do. No, no. That would be then the mother-in-law house would be on the on the back of like on the right side on the picture. Okay. And then my last question, ma'am, is your part of the um, part of what you're asking for is sort of a waiver of the side yard setback. Um, is there a property owner or a residence on that side, the side that you're going to be building toward with this grandmother flat, grandmother suite? You mean if we have neighbors just next door? Do you have neighbors on that side, which I, I don't know what direction that is. It's hard to tell. Um, looks on like the it, it's the west, the west, uh, the west side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, the neighbors know already that we want to, you know, that we all live together. And this is a, also a family who lives together with a grandma. And we are, you know, they are very, we are very mm -hmm. good neighbors and they they are you know like happy that we are all living together so they don't have any you know they live on the left side yeah we have one yeah. neighbor so so my question specifically is you 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 hit you had to hit them with a notice letter yes. are they aware are they aware of this proposal and did they yes. have any did they have any objection to it no they don't have any objection <laughs> Anything else, Mr. Dingfeld? No? Thank you very much. Anybody else? Anybody else? No? All right. Is there any public comment for this item? Anything um, that needs to be, well, any documents, emails, anything on this? No documents was received, nor no, no one registered to speak on this item. Is there anyone at the Tampa Convention Center? This is Eileen Rosario from Planning and Development, and there is no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. If there is no other discussion, may I have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved, Mr. Chairman. 
We have a motion to close from Councilman Miranda with the second from Councilman Goose. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection, the hearing is closed. What is the pleasure of council for item number one? Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, sir, Mr. Citro, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. On file number SU1-20-13 C on that petition, I move to overturn the zoning administrator's denial of the SU1 application, uh, which is SU120-13 C, because petitioner has demonstrated that the petition meets the specific standards set forth in 27-132 and the general standards set forth in section 27-129. Um, the use will ensure public health, safety, and general welfare if located were proposed and developed and operated according to the plan submitted. The use will not establish a precedence or encourage more intensive and, and incompatible uses in the surrounding area. Do we have a second, second. to that motion? Second. second from Councilman Goods. A roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Felder? No. Dean Felder? No, no. Lenny Stockle? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, I don't believe that's Madam Clerk. Don't believe you could other no. Correction. Motion care with Dinkfeld and vote no. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Your application has been approved. Thank you very much. All right. We have taken care of items number two and three. Item number four. Item number four. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Council uh, I'm sorry, Ms. Velez, if we can begin, if we can begin by making sure the petitioner is present or the applicant and we can swear in the witnesses for each individual hearing. Okay, I'll do that at the beginning of everything. Uh, is the applicant present? If you are, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself and please raise your, raise your right hand so we can swear you in. Good evening. Please raise your right. hand. Do you swear firm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And the clerk's office did receive written comments on this item and one registered live speaker. All right. We'll receive and follow those documents then later. Uh, Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, again, council members, this is a review hearing for a design exception one application. An alternative design exception is one that allows minor deviations from the strict application of the land development code subject to the limitations described in the code. The criteria that staff applies when evaluating an alternative design exception are found in section 27-60E5 of the land development code. This application did not meet that code criteria, uh, in this case for a skateboard ramp um, whose requirements are contained in section 27-290.9. Um, must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented. Those criteria are found at pages two to three of your staff report. Again, this review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence upon which staff based its decision. Council may impose reasonable conditions upon the design exception, should it be council's pleasure to uh, approve the design exception, you may impose conditions that ensure the public health, safety, and general welfare are protected and that substantial justice is done. Staff will now present the case to you and explain what is being requested. Following the presentation of the evidence and testimony, it will be up to council to either uphold the denial of this design exception request or overturn the denial. And again, should you decide to overturn, you may impose reasonable conditions. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Cotton. Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. Um, can I share my screen, please? What number are you on, Charlie? What number are you on? Eric, you're, you are already a presenter, so you just have to click oh, show your okay. Sorry. Um, 
I'm not sure why it's set up the way it is. I apologize. Um, this is DE 12140. The applicant is Ryan Clements for a property at 6012 River Terrace. Um, the property owner is asking for a, um, a skateboard ramp. So um, property is on SHRS, which is Seminole Heights residential single family. The property owner is on the river. And his, he does have a deep lot, which I'll show you the aerial and the site in a moment. Um, if you recall um, earlier this year, um, 27290.9 for the skateboard ramps was adopted by council with specific standards. Um, in this case, the applicant is asking to increase the width of the skateboard ramp from eight feet to 20 feet, four inches, the length from 22 feet to 155 feet, and the height from three feet to 4.75 feet. Um, urban design staff reviewed the request and found it um, did not meet the requirements of section 27-60. Um, the code uses the term minimal pos minimum possible. Um, the width is an increase of 150%, the length is 600%, and the height increase is 50%. So um, as you can see, the part highlighted in yellow, this is a site plan. The part highlighted in yellow is the um, skateboard ramp. And on the um, you can see from the aerial, it is a deep lot that's on the river. And the photos, um, since we didn't go on the property, and you could, if you look down towards where you can see the um, trampoline, you can see parts of the skateboard ramp. You can see the little bits of it here and here. That um, I guess the part that you would skate up and then skate back down. And these are just a photo of the property on the um, on one side of it is a single family home, and on the other side of the property, um, this is a view looking at the property. You can see the wooden fence between this site and the property on the other to the um, northern portion of the site. Um, does council have any questions regarding the request? Do we have any questions for the gentleman? Any questions? Councilman Kenny. Councilman Dinkfeld, yes, sir. So I was reading through the staff report and I was reading um, some of the response from the uh, petitioner. Um, there seems to be a dispute in terms of what it, what the actual length of of this is. Yes, uh, absolutely. I, I get well, hold, hold your comments, Mr. Clements, until yes, sir. Um, but anyway, in in regard, uh, can you speak to that, Eric? Um, uh, he seems to want to confine it to the, I guess, the elevated area, and and you guys look like you're including perhaps portions of the driveway. Um, or, or if you'd rather wait, wait and respond after he makes the presentation, uh, it's up to you. Oh, well, it's, it's, um, let me go back to the site plan. So my understanding is Mr. Clements is saying this is not 155 feet long. Um, that number in the site plan, I apologize. The site plan is small on the screen, but that was the number that was calculated by the urban design staff to say from, from this point to this point was 155 feet. And I do realize that the whole driveway from from the street to the property where the actual single family home is is Mr. actually. Chairman, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I can't see what what Mr. Cotton is referring to. It's not. Are you sharing your screen, sir? Because I I don't see it. I thought I was. Before and then it went back to the the camera views. Thank you, Mr. Shelby. Council, if you can't see it for whatever reason, please feel free to chime in. Okay. And, and by the way, this is now showing to me, excuse me, Mr. Cotton, this is now showing to me on my screen as two small slides. And it's really, really, frankly, difficult, if not impossible for me to see. It. So I don't, I don't know if you can get to one big slide. I apologize. I'm not sure. Let's see if this, does this help? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't sure which screen I was on. I apologize. Thank you. So when the part that's highlighted in yellow is the is the yeah. part that was identified as the skateboard ramp by urban design. He does have a driveway that runs the entire length of his property. That um as you can see from from the street all the way back along here. I do not believe that was calculated as part of 
the distance for the skateboard ramp, but I, I could be incorrect. I'll let Mr. Clements um, comment on that. But that was my understanding that when they, when that was reviewed and denied, that was the basis for, that's how they came up with the measurement of 155 feet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, any other questions? Hearing none, Mr. Clements, go ahead. I, I apologize, I was muted, I apologize. Mr. Cotton? Yes, sir. With this being, is, is this classified an accessory structure? I don't believe under 27290.9, when the section of the code was adopted, they redefined skateboard ramps as accessory structures. What are they, what are they defined as then? Um, they're, they're permitted as accessory structures, but not in the traditional sense of a shed or a detached garage. So they have, although, you know, 27290 has the standards for accessory structures, this has its own subset of those standards. So it has its own criteria that have to be met by the code. Then is the, is the criteria the code for these uh, skateboard ramps, do they have to meet setback? Um, no, sir. It is that it has to be met. Thank you very much, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Any other questions from council members? Any other questions? Councilman Miranda. I just want to make a, an observation that 155 feet, it's uh, just to give you what 120 feet is, and everybody would understand if it's correct. From home to second base is 120 feet. This is, if they say if it's correct, because 155, that would be in addition to center field of uh, 35 feet. If this is correct. So, Mr. Miranda, does the infield fly rule uh, uh, count here? Or what? It depends who's batting and who's catching. <laughs> in, uh, in all seriousness, um, in response to Mr. Citro's question, um, 27290.9A1, and I'm looking at the staff report, says skateboard ramps must meet the required yards for end setbacks for principal structures as established in the underlying zoning district. I would imagine there's some type of setback and some height of height restriction. I'm not that way. You don't have any complication with your neighbor if you do have a neighbor. Yeah, thank, thank you, Councilman Dinkfelder. So my apologies. In, in regard to, I'll keep reading. In regard to uh, the other dimensions, our our new code says eight foot width is the limit, twenty two foot length, and three feet height. That's in the staff report. Okay. Anybody else? Hearing none, Mr. Clemens, go ahead, sir. Hey, good evening. Um, may I please share my screen? All right, go ahead. Yes, we can Excellent. see it. Great, thank you. Um, You've seen the, the driveway from the street view down, same photo that you've just seen. Um, scrolling down here. I want to give you a little bit of background on what I am and what I do. I've been a Tampa resident for four years. I own businesses and property here in Tampa. I employ people locally and I work in the skateboard industry. My agencies, one hosts events locally, regionally, and globally, and the other one represents and manages some of the best skateboarders in the world. I wanted you to know first and foremost, why I had skateboard ramps in my home. So <clears throat> obviously I live in my dream home on the Hillsborough River. You know all this, now. I didn't realize how the presentation works. So I have a little bit of background, you already know. A um, couple of views that are uh, top left photo, you know, a view from the river to my house and from my house to the river in the top right photo. And the other photo on the bottom right is from, I was leaning against my house and I took that photo. And that is out towards the street, which you can't even see to put it in reference point how far my home is from the street, how my ramps are uh, not even visible or barely visible from the street. You have to actually look for them. And a couple other shots of my family. Um, when I don't travel for work, 
I spend a lot of time at home and I can essentially live anywhere in the country and do my job, but I choose to live here in Tampa. Um, you already saw this photo. The area of view is exactly the same as any other area of view. And I, I have that photo as a, as a point to show you that is no different than anything else from, from, the, uh, from the vantage points of my neighbors. I also have pretty good relationships with my neighbors. Um, unsolicited notes I got when I sent out the letter about this uh, about this meeting this evening. I feel that like Mr. Clements has always been a good neighbor in his driveway and ramp have in the way been a distraction or problem to the neighborhood or thoroughfare. I would like to ask the city of Tampa grant permission to reason his driveway and skateboard ramp. And this text from another neighbor, I got your letter. I'm cool with whatever you're trying to build. Let me know if I can do anything to help. Down to my next slide. You've seen all this now and, and this is another plan that I that I submitted to the city showing that, um, that I, uh, I, I was already within so much of the code with the exception of the actual restrictions of the skateboard ramps themselves. So what you'll see where, where there's the, where, where we're not seeing things eye to eye here is that all that area that you're considering 155 feet long is actual flat concrete on the driveway. So it is truly an extension of my driveway with small rideable obstacles sprinkled throughout. So everything proposed that I propose is significantly smaller than what I already have. Um, of course, I'm managing this project myself because that's how you do projects like this. And I've worked with several months. I worked for several months with the people of the city ahead of time to make sure that this would pass. And then of course these codes were created. Um, my permit was denied, as you know, and this, this setback that is, sorry, the, the length of 155 feet, that's the length of all of the concrete in its entirety from the point where there are existing ramps up into that, the, to that little point up towards the street. So all the flat concrete is being considered a ramp and the length times width as well, that's not defined in the codes at all. So no one would actually know what is the length of a ramp or the width of a ramp. I'm gonna get that to that in a minute. And then saying that I wanted the ramps 4.75 feet tall, that's not true either. The tallest obstacle I propose is under three feet. So I'm not sure where that came from. I had to get an elevation survey and jump through every hoop that everyone else does. Um, so, as you know, there's new code for skateboard ramps. Once again, I didn't know how this, this hearing was going to go. Uh, I want to show you this photo here and speak to it. That's a planner that's uh, outside of Orlando, and it's a planner with a radius. So it's not a skateboard ramp, but you can skateboard on it. And I'm going to back that up a little bit and, um, and get into what the definition of a skateboard ramp is. So essentially, everything is a skateboard ramp. You can ride a skateboard on whatever you want. And if you take a look at the top left photo, that's a, that's a handrail um, in New York City. On the bottom right is a stage in Santa Monica, California. On the top right, those are actually planners, of course, as you can see with radiuses. They're not skateboard ramps, but that's in downtown Los Angeles. And on the bottom left is a, a that's a driveway on Columbus Drive that was recently laid that I saw in the last three weeks, brand new construction. And um, that on that ramp is actually, on that embankment right there, is actually steeper than some of the obstacles I was going to build on my driveway. But of course, that is not considered a skateboard ramp, it's a driveway. But what I'm building is considered a skateboard ramp. So I'd like to give you an example. I could build these planners, but I could build them 10 by 10 or 20 by 20. And I could put Canary Island date palms in them and I can put them on radiuses uh, or I could build the angles of the planners at 70 degrees instead of 90 degrees. And that's a skateboard ramp. So the definition itself is what the problem is. So if you go down into the code specifically, but shall not be allowed in front or corner yards. Why? My yard's 350 feet deep. You put a tennis court, basketball court, a pup top course, trampolines, pools, decks, parkour obstacles, no skateboard ramps. Okay. And then can anyone tell me why a skateboard ramp can't be wider than eight feet or taller than three feet? And, and that's a bit of a rhetorical question, but you can, I can build a two-story deck on the river and get a permit for that. 
I can park a 35 foot long, 12 foot tall RV in my front yard. And the limit on my house is 35 feet tall. And then the length of a skateboard ramp. So you're including the driveway on that, but it's not the driveway. That's flat concrete. Okay. And are the decks of ramps on skateboard ramps included in the measurement? Uh, because you could build a, a big deck off your property and then a skateboard ramp, and you're including the left, the, the width of the deck off the house onto the ramp. That doesn't seem to be fair. And then the length is technically on a skateboard ramp, the length is determined by the width of the decks, the radius of the transition, and the flat bottom added all together. So, it, but it's an irrelevant measurement, skateboard ramps, but it's in our city code. Residential use is equally ambiguous. You can't really tell what we're, what we should be allowed to do here with the length of the width. So, talking about the next page here on the, on the second page of the codes, install solid fence. So, no matter how small a ramp is constructed, no matter how big the lot or how wide the lot, a fence must be installed. But not for a basketball court, not for an RV. My property is actually within this portion of the code already, as indicated on the plans. Um, and then you have to plant a row of evergreen trees, such as the dust from a podocarpus. So picking out the podocarpus, you can build a 22 foot long ramp. I accidentally wrote wide there. And on each side of the plant, plant a single podocarpus that grow tall and straight and don't cover anything from a three gallon pot on a 20 foot center. And that box is checked. It doesn't seem to make any sense either. And then ramps should be constructed of sound dampening materials, such as insulation, foam board sheathing, rammed earth, or similar similar methods. Okay, so how loud are urethane wheels on concrete? Okay, I asked the city this as a, uh, and they said, well, you might be making loud noise, you know, when you skate the ramps. So now I'm being judged on what I'm gonna do with my ramps and how good of a skateboarder I am, how loud I'm gonna be on my skateboard. So bicycles create essentially zero noise on these ramps, same with scooters, my kids and myself ride bikes, on my kids ride scooters on these ramps. Bouncing a basketball is significantly louder than any skateboarding on these ramps at all. My kids running around playing with their friends is louder. And my sound system that I have outside is significantly louder than any skateboarding could be. And rammed earth, I consulted a 20 year professional that does this and he had never heard of that material ever being used. So this on this next page, uh, that's actually within the city, Tampa, city of Tampa limits and was built just before the code was enacted. So I feel like our new codes in our city should solve problems and make our community safer. And this skateboard code does simply not do that. It's limiting my freedom as a taxpaying citizen of the, of the city. Um, and our professionals generally consulted to write these codes. There's no way a professional was, was enlisted in this um, procedure. Um, they're written haphazardly, they're written subjectively. They actually don't make a ton of sense when it comes to actual skateboarding on the ramps. It's obvious that no one with a basic comprehension of skateboard ramp constr construction was involved at all. And then the specs of the skate parks within the city of Tampa limits, they aren't even, they don't, they don't even fall within the writ newly written codes. So even our own, even our own city parks are outside of the codes now. They did it. So going forward, what's going to happen with those kind of skate parks? So my conclusion, my request here is that obviously I want to be able to build everything. Um, I'm willing to build them up to structural codes, get permits, do whatever I need to do to make it legit, as I did with all the ramps that I already have. But the design of my skateboard ramps, how big they are and how long they are, they should be calculated correctly and they should not be the decision of the city to how to do it. And I would like to also revisit and rewrite the codes for the skateboard ramps uh, in general. They're, they're unfair, and I'm personally willing to donate my time and expertise as well as enlist assistance of my professional colleagues as well. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And uh, thank you very much for uh, for hearing me out. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions from council? Councilman Dinkfelder or Councilman Goobs? Oh, wait, no, I have Councilman a... Dinkfelder, then Councilman Goobs. Yeah, I don't have a question for Mr. Clements per se, um, but I, I do have a question when, when he's done. So. Go ahead, uh, Councilman Coots. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Shelby, I know I'll stop me if I'm going down the wrong street. Uh, Mr. Clement brought up the, the, the word noise. And my, my main factor when I look at this, uh, some of this criteria, is, is this for just your family recreational or is this a part of your business? 
No, it's recreational. It's my. It's what I do with my family, and hang out at my I'm house. Just, I'm just asking you're professional, so I'm just you know. No, no, I'm not professional. I'm, I work in the skateboarding industry. I'm a professional okay. in the industry. Um, I use this for exercise, for fun. Um, I don't like to skate with a bunch of people. I do it on my own. Of course, I have friends over, just like anyone would have friends over and use use you know skate there. There, you know, just like you use your swimming pool. But no, absolutely not. Nothing. Nothing like that. Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes. Dink Felder. So there is an objection in the file. Um, it's regarding the, so that your property is 6012 River Terrace. This uh, objection, I can't really read her name, um, but it's 5715 River Terrace. Um, it's hard for me to know exactly how far away that is from your from your house, sir. Um, it sounds like it might be a four or five, six properties away. Yeah. Do you do you know this person? Have you spoken with them? No. no, I don't. No one's spoken to me at all about this, other than what I shared with you. Am I did you see the, did you see supporters? the objection? Did you see the objection letter in the file at all? I I haven't. I, I haven't seen anything. This is all news to me. Okay. Mr. Dingfelder, uh, is it a long thing? Is it there a way to make it available to the uh, to the applicant? You want me to hold it up like that, Marty? Uh, oh, oh, there you we... can't make out. You can't make out the name. I see. Uh, somebody, somebody pulled it see up. Somebody put it up. Well, Whoever it looks like that. Michelle, and I, I can't make out the name. But sir, do you see that on your screen now? I do. I do. Okay. Take the opportunity to please take a look at it. It's so, nice to you. Zoning managers correctly. Why are so existing? It, it, it was, um, historical characteristic of our neighborhood. My house was built in 85 and looks like a French chateau. Um, that doesn't seem to make any sense to me. Um, incompatible, more attractive to attractive is a, an opinion on, on, and I don't understand how that to non residents, what difference does it make? And my next door neighbor's house sold for $1.3 million uh, within a year. The listing agent, uh, real estate agent, actually used pictures of my ramps and said, cool skate park next door. They used it as a highlight. Um, that it, it was completely, and I don't even know who this is or how far 5715 is from my house. I'm not familiar with this person. It's intended to protect residential neighborhoods from in the, but the length, width, height, and local provisions will, will render it meaningless. Um, yeah, sure. But the, this, these codes are all new. They've never been challenged. They, uh, they need to be revised. They, they, um, don't allow people to build what they want to build and within absolute reason. So, um, and thank you, thank, thank you, sir. Um, just, just out of fairness, I, I will note that his neighbor across the street provided a letter. I don't know, uh, whoever put that last one up might want to put this one up, uh, Chib Anderson. And he says he's a he's a crowd directly across the street. Says Mr. Clements has been a good neighbor. Um, in no way is this a distraction or a problem to the neighborhood of the thoroughfare, and he would ask us to grant those. So anyway, just out of fairness. Uh, Thank you. Uh, yep. Yeah. I don't know if those two are the only ones that we've received, Madam Clerk. Uh, do you have any any others that I'm not seeing? Thanks. In the, in the electronic file, there's six or seven um, in there. One of most of them are the form letter, but there's another one. Sorry, Mr. Chair, for stepping in. But there's another one also that alleges that the original structure uh, was put in without a permit. Maybe you would want to respond to that too. Uh, for me to respond to that one? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, that's true because I didn't know I needed permits, so I went back and got them after the fact. Completely permitted. Um, built to code that built in the code anyway, just cause that's how you build skateboard ramps, you know, um, and I provided cross sections, elevation survey and got permits for that. And the only reason I did that in the first place, is I didn't realize I needed that to, uh, to, I needed a permit to build skateboard ramps. Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Susan Johnson Velez, uh, legal department council. I just wanted to, um, remind you, I know there's been a lot of testimony about, um, changing the skateboard ramp code section. Um, but the criteria that you must evaluate this 
design exception application on are the criteria for review in section 27-60 that are summarized there are set forth on pages two and three of your staff report. So those are the criteria that you have to evaluate and you must um, evaluate it based on the current skateboard code, notwithstanding any changes that might be proposed or made in the future. You have to base it on, on the criteria that are, uh, available today. May I please speak again? So, so I under, understood. Um, of course, I've spoken to that because I didn't know how else to address um, city council on these codes and discuss them. I didn't know who to talk to. So with that in mind, um, considering it's 155 feet and it's flat concrete that I, I would like you to take into consideration. These ramps are significantly smaller than 155 feet because they're actually, they're actually quite smaller. Um, I don't know what specifically the longest one is, but it's probably eight or 10 feet. So it, it doesn't go outside of those, those numbers anyway. Um, if you don't count the flat concrete, the flat concrete could be parked on, driven on, turned around on. So that's actually my driveway. It's an extension of it. And I just happen to have these ramps on there as well. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if I may. Councilman Citro. Thank you. Ms. Johnson Velez, I, I, when I brought up the, about this being an accessory structure and, and meeting setbacks, can I ask if any conditions uh, as to setbacks, if, if this council approves it? You may impose reasonable conditions, Mr. Chair. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Citro, um, to ensure the public health, safety, and general welfare. Yes, you may impose conditions should it be council's desire to approve the design exception. Thank you, Mr. Clements. Uh, being a former thrasher myself, when I was when I was very very young, uh, has it has it been a thought of yours to place this further away from the property line? Absolutely. Oh, I'm, I'm happy to do that. I do have one of the ramps is unfinished. Um, and that was when I, I got a permit from, um, that's when I got stopped during construction the first time around when I didn't get permits and I fixed all that. So I never finished the back of that ramp. So that's the only reason that it's over the setback. Now I'm more than happy to finish that ramp up and zigzag it right off the property. No problem whatsoever. Um, Absolutely. I, I want to come to a reasonable um, conclusion here. I want to be able to build when I, what I build. I don't want to make it, and I don't want to make a, be, be a nuisance to any of my neighbors. I, I really am not at all. Um, I have, obviously, you know, I have a family and friends with my, with the majority of my neighbors. The ones I'm not friends with, I don't know. Um, I have no problems. So absolutely willing to, to compromise. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, I voiced my concerns. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Belez. Thank you. You're welcome, sir. Councilman Zane. Point of order, Ms. Carlson. Are we doing Dingfeller first? There was a point there was a point of order raised, Mr. Chairman. Point of order. Yeah, the point of order, and you might have done this already, Mr. Chairman. I apologize if you have, but have we asked about the convention center? No, we haven't gone to public comment yet. We're just still on the applicant and any questions to the applicant by council members. Okay, because um I do see that there's four or five, at least four or five letters in here in opposition in the file and I was just wondering if anybody else is over there. Okay, uh, Councilman Carlson, do you have anything, sir? Yeah, and, and just for the applicant, as it, maybe they'll, they'll show them to you and they're on, online, but um, as I can see it, most of those are just a form letter that say the same thing over and over again, uh, but there is that one that's different. Um, Ms. Uh, uh, Johnson Velez, stop me if I start to wait in territory I shouldn't, but um, Mr. Clements, the, the, as I remember it, the, the policy that we have in place was in part due to a particular complaint about sound from surrounding uh, neighbors who were worried about the sound of uh, the skateboard banging against the wood. So yeah. I'm sure an expert on this, um, it, it, we're not looking to redo the ordinance tonight. We can talk about that later if you want. Okay. But, uh, but uh, how it, it how you must be constructing yours in a professional way, um, or, or are you? What are what are the what are the ways that you might mitigate the sound? That the the ordinance has some restrictions regarding sound, but how um, how, how would a professional mitigate the, the sound problem? Yeah, the, um, the the way so the way these codes are written, they're they're they should be for wood. There should be def definition between wood and concrete. Um, so there's not at all. So that, that's part of it right there is that with concrete, there is no way to mitigate the sound. It's just simply not loud. I mean, you've heard a bicycle rolling down 
the street, you've heard a skateboard rolling down the street, the smoother the concrete, and the concrete is exceptionally smooth on my driveway, you essentially can't hear it at all. Now, you're assuming that you're going to, you know, someone's jumping in the air and smashing the board down and doing all that. That's the assumption. I mean, I'm older than some of you on here. Uh, it's not, that's not what's happening. So that's like, I think, it, I, I think I feel like the noise part of it, it it's almost a, it, it's, it's a moot point because that's like saying, okay, we don't want you to dive into your pool because it's only three feet deep. So you can't build it next to your house because you may jump into it. So could it be loud? Could a skateboard hit the coping at the top of the ramp and be loud? Yes. But you can't even hear me skate the ramp from the street, much less, it, it's just not, it, it doesn't make any noise. Not to mention, if you're just riding bicycles on it or scooters, you can't hear it at all. So it, it um, the way the code needs to be rewritten would be like separating wood and concrete, not concrete, so it doesn't even apply. With wood, yeah, there are ways to insulate it or, or box it in or build shrubbery all the way around it, that sort of thing. But, and the other thing I would suggest would be like time limitations, you know, it's like, yeah, you can't use it after dark or you can like that, that sort of thing. If, if, a, if a wood ramp is going to be loud, but that wood ramp that I had in my presentation, the, the, the really, really big one guys ride bikes on that. And I've been there when they're riding, you can, you literally can barely hear them because of the bike tires on the ramp. So we're assuming that someone's going to ride something on there. That's going to be loud, but it could be, that they're going to ride bikes on it at all times, and it's not going to be loud at all. Thank you, Mr. Right. Chair. Sir. We will now go to public comment. Do we have anybody registered to speak on the phone uh, or anybody at the convention center? We did have um, Geraldine Holloway, but she has not showed up, but she also did um, submit a written comment on this item. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it briefly. All right. Um, anyone in person at the convention center? This is Eileen Rosario from Planning and Development, and we have no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. That settles public comment. Any other questions or comments from city council members? Unless, uh, if there's none, we can have a motion to close. We we'll close. Councilman or Mr. Shelby, you're muted. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see Mr. Dingfelder wanting to be recognized. Did you have something to say, Mr. Shelby? Uh, just a chance to have the uh, uh, applicant have the closing words before you close the public hearing. Okay. Address we'll address we'll and by the way, if there's anything that council wants to do relative to this particular case that involves asking the petitioner um, whether or not they agree or changes to the site plan, not to suggest that that's the case, but if that is the case, the time to do it is uh, probably before the public hearing closes. That would be ideal and before rebuttal. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair. Dave Felder, then see through. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, when Ms. Holloway seems to be um, the the major opponent on this, and she probably generated the the letter for her neighbors to sign, which is fine. That's her right to do. I'm sorry she's not online to to actually speak to us tonight. Um, she says she owns the property directly across the street and multiple other properties in the neighborhood. Um, I don't know that she lives there, but I don't know. If I, you know, I know. I think I may know who you're speaking about now. Um, but yeah. Well, oh. Hold up one second. Um, she she speaks to the various uh, variances that that she she claims she's looking for, and that's you know that's for us to discuss. But one of the things at the bottom that concerns me a little bit, and I want Mr. Clements to speak to it before we close. Um, she says uh, he's the founder and general manager of the company, and company headquarters include a private skateboard park. That's neither here nor there. But then she goes on to say the applicant hosts and organizes skateboard events locally and internationally. That's fine. She says several times a year, the applicant hosts trade events at his residence. The events are attended by hundreds of skateboarders who take over the neighborhood and uh, generally show no respect for others. Granting the exception will increase the commercial potential of the applicant's dream driveway and adversely impact the character in the neighborhood. I'm not going to get into whether or not the skateboarders have or haven't been polite in the past. But it does concern me a little bit in terms of, 
and maybe this is something in addition to what Mr. Citro suggested about, I think you, uh, Joe suggested about hours of operation, or somebody else mentioned it, Mr. Clements himself, perhaps we can have a reasonable limitation on the number of guests that Mr. Clements might have at any given time. So this doesn't become an extension of his commercial venture. I'm sure that's not your intent, Mr. Clements, but it's our, it's our job not only to protect your property rights, but to protect the rights of your neighbors. So, you know, and there's always a balance there. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. Is there anything reasonable that you might suggest, Mr. Clements, in terms of limiting the number of people that you might have there at any given time? You yes, uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond to that. So I'm, I have had parties there before. Of course, it's my house and there's stuff that's there. No way was it commercial. There was no a commercial opportunity for me to do that. I was simply hosting people that were in town. Um, it's a very unique uh, driveway. It is known. I, I'm just because of who I am in the industry and and what I do. There are pictures of it online. There's it's very easy to follow, and the hashtag is Dream Driveway. So of course my neighbor's going to know about that. Um, th then I have people over, uh, but I've done that. Uh, Please note also that I had started building the driveway before I founded the company that I currently own, companies that I currently own. So it was not a commercial um, adventure in, in any capacity. Um, I have no lights um, at there at all. You can't skate past dark ever. Um, I've turned the, the one time she's talking about that where the police came out and to the house for noise, and it was for music. Turn the music off. Um, it was not for skateboarding. And then... So, um, so let, let's just cut to the chase, though. Uh, is is there any numerical suggestion that, that you could help us out with? I, I'm not trying to limit your ability to have sure. reasonable you. parties, uh, but as related yeah. to this skateboard. I, just like anyone else would have a, a party for a, a big 100 people. I, how, who can't have a... I like When the police came to my house, they asked me what kind of event I was having. I said, an event? I'm not having an event. I'm having a party. It, this is... I, I, like, I have... I've, I had more people at my house for my kid's first birthday party than I did at this particular party. So I, I don't know why I would be limited on the number of people I'm allowed to have in my house. If that's the only way you're going to pass that, I'm, I'm more than happy to be able to talk about it. But to, to limit the number of guests I'm supposed to have in my house, it's, just, it's like saying you're going to build an epic pool and you're not allowed to have a party. So I'm not trying to limit the number of people you have at your house. What I'm suggesting is, is the number of people who might be skateboarding. I mean, that, you know, that so this, understood. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so let's say, let's say there were a hundred people at my house, maybe 15 of them were skateboarding like that, 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 that or 10 at a time. You can only skateboard one or two at a time as it is. So that that's not the, it's not even safe to have more than the way that it goes. You can't skate a bunch of people at a time. So it doesn't seem like a, a relative measurement of, of, how we should regulate what I'm doing. I think it should be time. I'm happy with times. I'm happy with dark. I never intend on putting lights out. I'm a, I'm an early riser. I can not skate before a certain time. I can skate, stop skating at a certain time. I'm more than happy with that, but limiting the people I'm allowed to have in my driveway. And then are we going to calculate skating? What if I have a party and say, okay, only 20 people are allowed to skate is that same neighbor calls the police. And they're going to come on and dictate how many people are actually skating at the time. And it sounds like we're going down a slippery slope of, of how to use my ramps. All right, Councilman Dinkfeld, anything else? Um, I like I, I like the notion of, I'll listen to what other council members have to say on this point of, you know, maybe 10 skateboarders on it, it on the, you know, on it at any given time. Mm -hmm. that what you, if Mr. Clements, that's what you said, by you know, uh, any more than that might not be safe anyway. So if that's a number you right. can live with. I'm not saying you can't have spectators or, you know, what, I'm not telling you you can't have a party. But uh, yes, sir. there's a concern expressed here that this could become an extension of your commercial venture. And I think it's our job to try and keep it from happening, as well as I like the uh, no, no skating after dark. I think that's reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 10 people at a time there it's not possible to skate 10 people at a time so i'm more than happy to say that not more than 10 people at one time will be skating on my driveway okay 
Okay. Councilman Citra, I believe you were next, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Mr. Clements, uh, my main concern was the proposed uh, skateboard area being so close to the neighbor's property, being so close to your property. Would you, and Ms. Velez, would you please follow me on this one and see if I can work this out? Would you be uh, willing to move it to the other side of the driveway? Um, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yes. Um, the only thing I would request that I'd be able to do would be to finish the one unfinished ramp that's still on the existing side of the driveway. Just finish that ramp off, zag the concrete out, and get it back to the driveway as quickly as possible so you can still ride on it and turn around on it in a car. That's another issue I have as well, is that the driveway is so skinny, backing you know, even Amazon trucks or any delivery truck, it's it's difficult to turn around if my if my vehicles are parked there, because I have two trucks. And um and so it's difficult to stay to stay on the concrete and back up. So if I could finish that one ramp, I'm more than happy to to switch it to the other side. Yes. Is that will that meet the setbacks, Mr. Cotton? Are you there? Yes, sir. Will that meet the setbacks? If he puts it on the side where to the north. Yes, I believe that's correct. Um. Yes, the required setback would then be seven feet. For center line zoning and that's what the shrs requires so yes it would be it would be able to meet the required setback okay miss velez am i able to ask of that request well you you're certainly able to ask for uh reasonable conditions again that gar ensure the public health safety and welfare and if mr cotton is confirming that those meet the setbacks then absolutely um those are entirely appropriate um I might suggest too, because there is a site plan that shows these improvements, um, if we might want to consider having um, a revised site plan permitted so that everybody is aware and we're all um, in agreement as to what is going to be placed on this property if it is council's uh, pleasure to approve this with those conditions. I, I would like to see that. Mr. Clemens, could you provide that for us in the future? If yes, we're sir. To this? Yes, sir. Uh, again, as as a young thrasher, I would have loved to have had this at my house. Your property is a little yeah. different from most of the properties within the city limits of Tampa. Yeah. I, I feel confident that um, you're a man of your word, and that you allow just as just few uh, thrashers, excuse me, skateboarders on on this on this ramp, and that you will keep it at a certain time as not to violate any of your neighbors' uh, rights. Also. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Ms. Johnson Velez. Welcome, sir. A point of order, Mr. Chairman. Councilman Dink Bellamy. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Maniscalco, making me laugh. Um, Ms. Johnson Velez, um, uh, um, similar to uh, what we what we do in the variance review board that Joe and I served on many years. Um, since this is just a one-shot deal without a second reading, I think we need I think we need a site plan. We need to continue this for a revised site plan and come back for a final decision. That would be my humble recommendation. May may I add something, um, Mr. Dingfelder? A question, and it's council's choice if there are any other conditions to um, address the adverse um, impacts that council would find as a result of this hearing, that that also be added to the site plan so it could come back in a complete fashion. And Mr. Clements uh, uh, would, uh, would work with staff to be able to get that done. So that doesn't have to be um, brought up again when it comes back to council, it'll all be included, all the notes and everything else that would be um, requested by council would be included on the site plan as well. Okay, any other council members? Uh, Councilman Dinkfo, that was not a motion, correct? Not yet? I'm not really sure of the, of the motion. Maybe the motion is just to continue this. Yeah, I'll make a motion. What can, well, uh, before you do, I'd, uh, I'd like to hear from the applicant one more time if he has anything at this point. Right, I was going to make sure that he was okay with, with what I was going to go with. Uh, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, I'm comfortable with this direction. Thank you. And also for the purposes of the record, Mr. Chairman, again, there is nobody live now willing to speak. 
Is that uh, Madam, Madam Clerk, is there anyone, did anyone log in for that public comment? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Councilman Dinkwell. So with that, I, um, I'll make a motion to uh, continue um, this matter with a, a strong suggestion to Mr. Clements that he provides the site plan in accordance with um, uh, Mr. Citra's uh, comments. Um, and um, and also that they, that somewhere he and staff uh, include on the site plan or somewhere else appropriately the limitations um, of uh, no skating after dark. Obviously that changes by the season. And, um, and also uh, no more than uh, 10, 10 skate boards um, in use uh, on the driveway at any, at any given time. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Chairman, I, I got Chairman Miranda. Uh, again, uh, I'm just referring to what the city attorney told us. Uh, and I understand what Mr. Clemens is involved in, and I appreciate his straightforward uh, spokesman that he's been. But we are looking at something that's uh, in the record as a law on, on, on these items, and it's uh, eight feet or 20 feet, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know. I don't know now if the ramp is 22 feet or 90 feet or 100 feet. Uh, I, I don't know anything regarding, I don't know about the height from three feet to 4.75. He explained it and I appreciate it very much what he said, but I'm gonna have to see this thing before I vote on it. All righty, Councilman Goods. I'm gonna have to concur with Mr. Miranda. I'm gonna have to see it before I can vote on this item as well. I have some still concerns. All right, anybody else? This crossing. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can I, can I just ask one question? Um, Ms. Johnson Velez or anybody else who's who's looking at it, uh, we talked about sound and the and the fact that it's a, it, the intent is to build it in concrete. Um, is it is the way the site plan is written? Is that sufficient to require that it would be built in concrete, or or is it possible that someone could could build it out of wood instead? Well, there are no, um, as, as far as I can tell in the code, and, and Mr. Cotton might be able to speak to this as well, but there, there are no um, spe specifics on material that these can be built out of, or if they can be a combination of material and how you calculate the, the width and the length and the height and so forth. So um, at this point, it, I, it would be up to, in, to council's interpretation of that because there is no specific um, conditions or regulations contained in the current code. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll leave that up to anybody else if you think we should include it. It sounds like you know, he's going to build it out of concrete anyway, but if you all think we should include it. Uh, quick question for the applicant. Since this is being uh, continued, how much time would you need? Um, the, the thing about it is it's easy to get a drawing for the schematics as long as I don't have to provide another structurally structural engineer drawing so i can turn that around in a couple weeks but if, I, if i'm going to need another structural engineer drawing, i really hope i don't need to because every time i do that i have to pay a thousand dollars for someone to do that um for me it's a, to get a to get a drawing of what i'm going to do is very very simple and uh yes i do intend on building a uh, concrete and that that was specified in there and with cross sections and and all that so so um yeah absolutely that's a question for staff um, this is a site plan controlled. What is required, Mr. Cotton? Or Cotton Planning and Development. Um, there's going to be a difference between what's required for what City Council is requesting and what's going to be required when Mr. Clements goes to the permitting. Once he changes, I can't speak for the permitting office. I'm not in permitting, but I imagine they're going to require new sealed engineer drawings for any changes because they've reviewed what has been submitted. The site plan that's a part of the packet is what has been submitted for the permit office. When, when he switches and he puts the ramp on the other side, for instance, that's probably gonna require a new seal from a structural engineer as part of the process. And yes, that does get expensive. Not that that should make a determination in the council's thing, but yes, keep that in mind that the plan that he needs to submit for 
council to review will not be acceptable 100 percent for city for the permitting office it still needs to meet the required requirements of the florida building code and such all right anything else mr shelby no you're muted the question is how long does the applicant need if the applicant wishes to get counsel uh to uh um uh, have this come back unless the unless i guess the other alternative is for a vote up or down this way as it is um but if the count but if council feels i'm going to have a continuance and mr clements agrees with that and the reason why then the question is how much time and i don't know if he can be advised or eric you have suggestions how long would this need to be continued or is that Mr. Clemens is the fact that you may in fact ultimately need to have that survey redone or a site plan redone. Um, do you want to um, uh, then take that into account and, um, and, and pick a date? Um, or, go, or go forward or go forward tonight, up or down. So if I, if we went forward tonight with a vote as is, that means it's case closed and we're done. If you say no, correct. That's correct. That would, my, Mr. Cotton, I believe that's the case. Yes, sir. That, that would be the, the council would make the decision tonight. Yeah. You're given, an op, you're given an opportunity to address what council has stated as being in their way of uh, determining the facts. They've made findings that they believe there are adverse impacts that may need to be addressed. They brought them to your attention. What is your pleasure? Um, I'll go with the continuance because I, I would also like to that maybe obviously this isn't the time to talk about it, but however we address these codes in general is would be my next step once I get to build um, the addition of my driveway and finish what I currently have. But I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll, you know, if I need to, what I would like to do is resubmit a drawing to you folks to make sure that to council to make sure that you're going to approve it, and then I can get the structural drawings. No, no problem whatsoever after that. That that would be be a lot easier that way than to than to go the opposite way and fail again. Right. And the question for staff is whether that is legally sufficient for the purposes of tonight's, uh, or ultimately when council makes the final decision and and, and approves what is in effect a site plan controlled um, uh, item. For specifically for the design exception for council to make a determination, just the site plan is all, all that's required. A site plan is all that's required. Yes, sir. Once he gets this, once the site plan is submitted, it shows. The location of the ramps and several and the other issues that have been addressed by council tonight um if okay once that application once that clear? Is that plan, the the permitting side will take place at a later date anyway so he doesn't have to invest that money now without knowing what city council will eventually decide okay understood thank you for that clarification sir thank you council thank you very you much me, you want me to restate the motion mr Mayor Scott Cole? yes sir go ahead okay so the motion is to continue, I would say, about a month. Um, uh, can somebody give me a date? On a we have October 22nd or November 12th. Um, Ms. Johnson Belez, Mr. Shelby, any preference? You got you got X number of cases. I, I um, Yes, Mr. Dingfeller, I, I believe, and I, I think Mr. Shelby's checking now, but I believe that October 22nd date is pretty, is full already. How about um, November 12th? I believe if I can counsel, I believe we have uh, two adopt, we have eight adoption plan amendments, which could go quickly. I can't promise one way or the other. Um, two review hearings from the zoning administrator, uh, one alcohol, uh, uh, what two day, alcoholic what beverages. If council is interested, this should go quickly, frankly, no, if it comes no, back the way no, no. council anticipates. What day are you referring to, Mr. Shelby? I'm referring no. to October 22nd. What? Okay, or I would assume if some of those plan amendments, the uh, those parks, those park amendments. I can't say. I mean, if the if the if the applicant wants to have greater assurance that he'll be able to complete it within a month's time, and, uh, yeah, that's not a month's time, the next problem. He can no, meet I, with Mr. Cotton, and they can they can. I, I think. All right, I'll move to. Well, I'm sorry, Ms. Velez. I was going to no, I was going to I was going to say I would suggest. I mean that. And I think the 22nd looks deceptively um, slight right. number of cases, <laughs> but I, I believe there it's going to be a longer night than we might than might that, be just by looking at the agenda. So I would suggest that 
you go to your next date in November. Not wanting to delay it anymore, but I, I do believe that those hearings are going to take longer. Thank you. Okay. November 12th. Is that right? Looking in full. November 12th. Second. It doesn't have to be perfect. Let's just find something. November November 12th. I think this would be fine. All right. November 12th. Okay. Um, Dean Felder. All right, and, and uh, the, the gentleman with his uh, agreement will come back to us. He can work with Mr. Cotton to come back with an acceptable site plan that includes reference, as Mr. Carlson says, to the concrete, which is already on that existing site plan, but he can make reference to it. Hours of operation, not, not, uh, not, at, not at, after dark, and no more than 10 people, and I think that's all the conditions that we'd like to see on the site plan. In addition to the one Mr. Citro was talking about, about um, moving it away from the setback. And that's at 5 501 p.m., sir? Yes. That's fine. And Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. May I put a friendly amendment to no Ramones or Sex Pistols music playing after six? No. I'm joking. Skateboarding. No, no, no. Those, those are the two that are going to be playing. Thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. Oh, and and Mr. Goods and Mr. Miranda, a vote tonight is just a vote for the continuance. So if you want to go see it, you can go see it. Go with that. Okay. All All right. Right. To come skate is welcome to come skate. I can roller skate, but I can't skateboard. So well, I don't know about that, but we'll see. Um, and, if you, and if you visit the site and have any communication, obviously they both need to be disclosed during the public hearing. Otherwise, it's an ex parte communication. Oh, I only go to United Skates. Uh, we have a motion from Councilman Dinkfeld. Do we have a second? Yeah. Second Councilman Vieira. Uh, let's just do a, a roll call vote for the continuance. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dinkfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. And Miranda? Miranda? You're, you're muted, sir. Yes. Motion carry unanimously. All right. Mr. Chair, could I ask a clarifying question? Please? Sure. Um, did we lose Ms. Johnson? Oh, there she is. Ms. Johnson Velez, um, or anybody else who wants to weigh in, what advice would we give to Mr. Clemens before he signs off regarding looking at the ordinance overall? Should he, shouldn't he just wait until after his case is heard or should, is it okay for him to go ahead and start on that as a separate path? Well, uh, you mean the revisions that he would like to see to the the ordinance itself. So, as it, it should he start on a on a parallel path on that, or should he just wait till after this is approved? What advice would you give him? Well, I mean that that would be a legislative decision. So that would be that would be a separate path from this application, which applies the criteria of the code. So that would be a separate path. So that. I mean, it doesn't adversely affect it. Okay, thank you. My way, if I may, if I may follow up on that, that is when it comes to dealing with staff, that's one thing. When it comes to deal with this decision making board, I would advise against it. So in other so words, he can begin that process working with the city staff, but it would be inappropriate to discuss it with city council. Thank you. Because of my recommendation. Because of the chance of ex parte communication. <laughs> exactly. Thank well, you. Thank you. So we'll wait till November. Understood. All right. Thank you very much. All right, that's it. That settles uh, that item number four. Thank you very much, Mr. Clements. We'll see you. Uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you, folks. All right. We are. We are going to item number five. We have six cases left to go. Item number five. Um, before we begin, uh, the applicant, if they would. Turn their camera on and then we could swear them in and, and begin from there. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And the clerk's office did receive written comments on this item. Thank you very much. Do we have anybody at the convention center that's going to speak on this just so we have a heads up? This is Aisha Osario. We have no one here. 
Is there anybody there at all? No? Okay, just you. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead, Mr. Cotton. Oh, I'll, I'll start just briefly, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan Johnson Velez, um, Legal Department. Uh, this is a review hearing for an SU1 special use permit pursuant to LDC section 27-61. Uh, again, an SU1 special use permit is one that has already been determined to be an allowed use if it meets the code criteria for the specific special use. In this case, it's for an extended family residence again. No specific criteria are listed on page two of the staff report. This application did not meet the code criteria, so petitioners are here to request a waiver from you, which staff could not grant because staff is not able to grant waivers. The petitioner has the burden to prove they meet the criteria for the waiver and council shall grant waivers if council finds that the application after granting the waiver is consistent with the applicable general standards set forth section 27-129. Council, this review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence upon which staff based its decision. You must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented, and staff will now present the case to you and explain the waivers that are being requested. Good evening, Council Eric Cotton, if I can share my screen, please. Um, so this is SU1, 20-45, the applicants are Jason and Amanda Curran uh, for, the property, for the property at 4809 West Juno Street, request is for an extended family residence. So the property is Odara 75, and as you are familiar with um, an extended family residence, um, the person living in the residence has to be a relative, it can't be a stranger, it, can't, it has to be either a, a blood relative or by adoption or by um, legal guardianship or by marriage. Um, the request was denied for two reasons. That was one of the reasons is the applicant uploaded the, the individual's driver's license, which is a um, piece. There's, there's some background noise that's, I don't know that, there's some background noise that, that keeps uh, interrupting. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Martin, I think it's, it's coming from your office. Just background. No? The only one here is me. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Cotton. Okay, so thank you. It was um, denied because the applicant's niece, who is Mariana Lee Olson, they uploaded the, her um, driver's license was uploaded, but evidence of the relationship between the two parties was not established at the time of the application. And just say so a little background, this received a variance back in 2018, it was BRB 1872. And I wanna make sure um, if either Councilman Sutro or Councilman Dinkfelder, and I'll ask Susan or Marty if it matters, if they were, if they heard that case, I don't think they were on the board in 2018, I think they were already elected to council. Um, and, so they were granted a setback variance for the front from 25 to 21, the rear yard from 12 to two, and the corner yard from 15 to one. That was for a first story addition. Um, as part of the provisions that you can see in the site plan, as part of the requirements of an extended family residence, you can't place the structure in a, in a, you can't place an extended family residence in a structure that's made conforming to a variance. Well, they're proposing to put a second story on this on the um, addition. So they, you can't, they couldn't go back before the VRB to ask for the variance and then establish the secondary use of the extended family. They need to go through the process, get denied right, and go so before council. Here we can check the whole desk. Um, this is just a, a, they're at the corner of um, Venus and Juno. This is the site in question. The property is under construction. Um, the applicant, I'll let her get into any detail she wants to share. Um, through 27-62, there's a process called reasonable accommodation. Um, due to the impending birth of a baby, we did a um, reasonable accommodation to allow them to start construction with the provision that when the use is no longer needed, they have to remove the reasonable accommodation, meaning that the structure has to be designed with the ability to remove the second story. Um, through going through the process, the applicant chose to, chose to go through the special use one to establish the extended family use. 
Um, I guess a picture of the house from the front, you can see the extended family proposed addition in the rear. Um, and then this is a side structure, side view. Uh, this is what was approved by the VRB in 2018. This is the addition that's being on placed on the second story. Um, does council have any questions for me? Do you have any questions for the gentleman? Yeah, I'm a little confused. Go ahead, yes, Council. Was that, was that that top not permanent? Where'd it go? Well, I don't know what I just did, so I apologize. Um, the top is is as part of an approval for an extended family for a reasonable accommodation. Excuse me. The uh, thank you. The um, so I'm not sure what I'm doing now. I apologize. I am technology. Um, here we go. Do y'all see that or no? Or am I just completely missing it? No. That on the screen now? Yes, we can oh, see it. Okay. I'll leave it at that and I won't touch it again. Um, to the reasonable accommodation, the zoning administrator approved the ability for them to do a second story with the condition that when the reasonable accommodation is no longer needed, the second story has to be removed. So through the process, and they understood this going in, if for some reason, once they no longer need the assistance of the niece, that would have to be put back down to one story. They'd have to remove the soft story. That's part of the reason why they're before city council for the, um, the special use appeal or petition for review. So, so just to clarify, <laughs> Uh, Wait, Councilman Goods and then Dean Feller. Go ahead, Councilman okay. Goods. So what, what you're telling me is that we permitted them to put a second story building you know, temporarily, and now we're going to tell them we need them to take it down to this particular point after our being permitted for, for a special use accommodation for our niece. Is that what you're telling me? If Council were to not overturn the decision of the zoning administrator, when the reasonable accommodation is no longer needed, they would have to remove it, yes. And again, I, I, I have to read up more of this code, but that, to me, that just makes no sense. But I'll continue to listen, but that doesn't make any sense to me. Okay. Well, I understand. If, if I can just clarify, sir, um, the, 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 the issue is that staff cannot grant a waiver to those criteria. Only council can grant waivers. And so that's why this is before you, because staff doesn't have the ability to, uh, to grant that waiver. I, I understand this, but I'm just saying to have someone in the beginning, put up a structure that, I mean, that's a structure. And then to say, take it down now. I mean, I, I just, I'm just, my mind's just baffled on that right now. And I'll, I'll listen on and get more, more clarity on this. Without, without, um, this is, this is um, Eric Cotton's um, planning and development. Without going into too much detail, the goal was they're, have, they're expecting a child and they'll go into greater detail. But the goal was to have this constructed and finalized by the time of the child's birth. And I don't know, I think the baby may have already been born or is gonna be born very shortly. So we were trying to work with the applicant to get this up as fast as possible. I'm not sure why it, it paused. I'm not sure where they are in the permitting process. Councilman Dinkfeld. Yeah, just to clarify, Mr. Goods, the, so we got two different processes going on. The, the first process that they took advantage of clearly it looks like it falls under the ADA, which says they, they, they need to put that second story up there for reasonable accommodations, which is an ADA term. So the administration is able to do that without us. Okay. If they sold the house or otherwise didn't have need for for that upstairs part for whatever family reason under the ADA, then the the reasonable accommodation goes away and they'd have to take it the upper part down, which is the ridiculous part that you're pointing out. But that I guess that's just the way the ADA and the reasonable accommodation work. Now we're in the second another phase because clearly they don't want they wouldn't want to take that down because uh, they put a lot of money into it. So now they're asking us for this SU1 exception, um, which still is not a permanent deal because 
it's you know it's only allowed uh, for limited purposes, this family purposes. Uh, so it's still going to have some constraints on it, but at least there's no destruction requirement. Does that help? Does that, anybody? I agree? find it difficult. I just I just think that uh, a lot of wasted effort here and money. It seems to me. Yeah, I would agree with you. All right. Any other questions from council members? That is Miranda again. Uh, it just uh, seems to me I don't know when all this happened, and and I'm sure not against it, but I I, I see things that here are two story. They certainly had to build the first story before they built the second story. The question is, at what time did we know what was going to happen happening, and why is it the first story, just the first story, with the apartment or whatever they're going to build there? I understand what Mr. Goulds is saying. Those are questions the applicant will have to answer. Thank you very much. Anybody else? All right. If not, we will go to the applicants who have been sworn in and are on the line. Go ahead, applicants. Uh, thank you so much, Eric, and thank you, um, everyone, uh, for your time this evening. Um, uh, we we did apply for a variance in 2018 um, for the house to be single story and just built out to the one foot setback to accommodate my disability. Um, I have lived in the Tampa area for 20 years. I served in the United States Air Force for 10. I'm a 9-11 veteran. I did three tours overseas during the war. I have 22 surgical incisions and I'm a 100% uh, disabled war veteran um, and I suffer from chronic pain. The initial plan for the house was simply to make the home ADA compliant in 2018. And as we began to draw the plans for that, some changes have happened in our life. Uh, the first one, the, the greatest one, is that I never expected to have any more children. I lost my reproductive organs in service to our country, and so I did not plan that we would have any other children. Uh, last year, a relative offered to carry surrogacy for us. Uh, and we do have a baby due next month. Um, this is a huge blessing, but because of my handicap, I'm actually um, unable to um, not only care for, but to be alone with the children by myself. Um, not only issues with the children, but issues with my own health um, outside of the baby. Um, I have issues with activities of daily living. Some days I need help showering or getting dressed, um, putting on my own shoes. Uh, I could collapse at any moment. I've been in the hospital in the emergency room three times um, since February. And while all of that is going on, um, last year also, our son um, was rushed to the hospital with seizures. Uh, we do have a four-year-old. Uh, he's autistic and started having seizures last August. Um, and because of that, we've had to take him to a number of hospitals here in the Tampa area, half a dozen neurologists, and flew him to the Cleveland Clinic to their pediatric epilepsy department in February, all of which exasperates my own health condition. So between having a special needs child, another child coming into the house, and a serious health condition of my own, we need, we need family support in our home. Um, because of um, restrictions with the home at the time that we were doing the planning, we then realized that the best thing that we could do was build a second story just above the garage. I obviously, I can't go up and down stairs. So we were just trying to uh, copy the footprint that was over the garage um, so that we could accommodate this. Uh, you will see that we've supplied letters um, from, I believe, six neighbors, all of which are the ones that are most affected um, by the work, the neighbors across the street from us, the one uh, next door. Um, no one has, uh, has complained. Everybody's in support of what we're doing. Uh, we love this neighborhood. This is our forever home. Um, and I'm not going to not be disabled at any time um, in my life, unfortunately. Um, the construction associated with the variance was to make the home more ADA compliant and the second floor is really an extension of that work. We would like to, you know, get the second floor approved um, 
so that we can help grow our family and do it in a way that's uh, safe for both me and our children. Thank you for your service. Thank you very much. Oh, and my niece, I, I, I thought I had also submitted her, uh, her birth certificate. She is my maternal niece. She is my sister's daughter. Um, she is carrying the baby. She is coming home uh, with us from the hospital and, and helping us um, raise this baby uh, together. All right, now we know. Thank you for the correcting the, the record. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for the applicants? Do we have anybody for public comment at this time? No one has registered to speak on this item. This is Aileen Grossario from Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I did read the uh, five or six letters uh, from, from the neighbors in support. Um, just for the record, I can't remember who brought this up, Ms. Johnson or Liz. Um, I, do re I do recall hearing this uh, as a variance a review board member, Joe, Joe and I were both there in 2018. And obviously this one stands out in my memory uh, very well. I don't think that would have any implications on my ability to to hear it tonight. Mr. Shelby or Ms. Velez, Johnson Velez, uh, feel free to chime in on that. But from my perspective, um, I don't believe that that would have any legal ramification. It very well may, though. Let me ask Mr. Citro if he has a recollection as well. Do you have a recollection, Councilman Dinkfelder, of Councilman Citro there? Or does Councilman Citro have his own independent recollection of being on the board at that time? Thank you, Mr. Shelby, Mr. Chair, if I may. Yes, after looking at the site plans, yes, I do have vague uh, recall of this this case when I was on BRB. Um, my suggestion, council members, in an abundance of caution, I think the proper co for, uh, course of action would be to abstain um, because um, this is a um, uh, this is a review of the zoning administrator, not the VRB. Let me see if I can be clear about this. I just want to be clear. Let Mr. Cotton clarify what council is deciding today was not a decision of the VRB or related to this particular petition, or is it? No, the VRB was just more for historic sense that they did receive a variance back in 2018. I brought up the fact about Councilman Dingfeld or Councilman Citro just to make them aware. I wasn't sure if they had served on the board, if they were on the board at the time and they remember this case, if there were any issues with that. Okay, okay, so that that being the case, this is not an appeal of the VRB, this is a decision of the zoning administrator, it is separate. Uh, as long as we could just make very quick inquiry of uh, each council member, can you be fair and impartial in your decision in tonight's case? Yes, absolutely, that's Dingfelder. Yes, I can also, Citra. Okay, then it would be appropriate you vote on this. It would be my opinion that uh, there is no conflict um, uh, based on uh, the information that we have in front of us. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, applicants, do you have anything else before we close the public hearing and go to a motion? I don't think so. I mean, we, obviously, this isn't the way we would want it to go through the process. Um, can imagine what our stomach might feel like right now. Um, but, uh, you know, I, we love our neighborhood and our neighbors, and we have no plans to go anywhere really the rest of our lives if we can help it. Uh, and, and um, you know, her disability is not the time that goes away. So, you know, the reasonable foundation, I don't imagine that would ever last unfortunately thank you all right thank you very much may i have a motion to close the public hearing i'll vote mr chairman motion to close from councilman second from councilman goods any objection hearing none by unanimous consent the hearing is closed what is the pleasure of council item number five councilman i'll, move, I'll move to uh, approve uh reversing um reversing or, or overturning the uh, staff decision 
in regard to SU 1-20-45. I believe that um, that uh, the, the facts of the case uh, and the evidence that's been, been presented to us justify um, overturning uh, that decision. I um, also want to point out the fact that that the footprint of the uh, family structure that they want to add is the exact same footprint as what's already been approved previously by uh, by the uh, city and the BRB, um, so, except that it's upstairs. Um, so, <clears throat> so anyway, based upon that, I believe that uh, the evidence shows a justification for the approval. And as a side note, on behalf of all of council, we appreciate your, your family service and your service, Amanda. Thank you. Second, Miranda. We have a motion from Councilman Dingfelder. We have a second from Councilmember Miranda. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Pedro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carried unanimously. Um, All right. Mr. Mr. Chair, before the, these uh, uh, Jason and Amanda leave, I want to confirm with them one thing and then I'll confirm with Mr. Shelby. Is your contact address 4809 West Juno Street? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, I'll be sending you a letter, that's all. Uh, Mr. Shelby, we are hereby finished. In other words, let me ask you this. If I was to send these folks a letter um, as, as my constituents, uh, should I wait beyond the 30 days on appeal or am I fine? Um, I don't, that's a very good question. I don't have, I don't see any objections in the record. I don't know what else has been preceded. Um, I don't know um, whether there's any interested persons involved in this. Um, I doubt it. I hope I, not. That, that may be the case. Uh, Council, uh, my suggestion is, could you please hold off till I confirm that? And if it's very well 30 days and an abundance of caution, then I would tell you that. But right now, I, I don't think I'm prepared to answer. That's fine. Okay. Thank you, guys. God bless you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much. If you notice in the agenda, item six and item number eight appear to be next door to each other, 48, 4108 North Nebraska, and 4106. If there's no objection, I'd like to hear those together or one after another, just so we could keep the agenda going. And uh, then we'll go back to number seven and then continue from there. So item six and eight being that they're, they appear to be next door. If we can hear those uh, back to back. And if I may, Mr. Chair, I need to disappear for five minutes. My mother just dropped off my son and I got to make sure that everything's good. So just for me, I'll be right back. My yes, apologies. Sir. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, before you begin, please, uh, the applicants, I, I believe, have uh, turned on their camera there uh, to be sworn in. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And the clerk's office did yes. not receive any written comments on this item. Thank you very much. Please begin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I will do just one presentation on both um, item number six and item number eight. I believe the issues and the reasons for denial are identical on both of these properties. So with mm -hmm. that, um, Council, I will note that this is a review hearing for an SU-1 special use permit. Um, again, an SU-1 special use permit is one that has already been determined to be al an allowed use if it meets the code criteria for that use that is found in section 27-129, which contained the general standards for all special use permits, as well as the section 27-132 uh, criteria for specific for the specific use, which in this case is for dwelling, multifamily, and single family attached. Those specific criteria are listed on page two of the staff report. This application did not meet the code criteria, so petitioners are here to ask a waiver from you, which staff cannot approve because staff cannot grant waivers. The petition has the burden, or burden to prove that they meet the criteria for a waiver, which council shall grant if you find that the application after granting the waiver is consistent with the applicable general standards set forth in section 27-129. 
This review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence presented to staff and upon which staff based its decision. Council must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented and staff will present the case to you and explain the waivers that are being requested. Thank you very much, Mr. Cotton. Good evening, Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. Um, there's two cases I just opened up, the, first, the one that was first on the agenda. So they're for addresses 4106 and 4108. Um, mm -hmm. SU 12049 is for 4108 and SU 12027 is for 4106. Um, the applicant for this is the same for both, which is Development Support Resources, LLC. Property is owned SHCG, which is Seminole Heights Commercial General. Um, there are two requirements under the special use criteria to do um, residential in the CG zoning district for um, residential single family attached. One is it has to have direct access onto an arterial or collector road. And the other is that it has to meet the underlying RM24, or in this case, because it's in Seminole Heights, the SHRM zoning district. So it meets the SHRM district, but it doesn't have direct access onto a local, onto a arterial or collector road. Um, what you're seeing on the screen now is the proposed site plan. What you're seeing here is the mirror image of what's gonna be proposed to the south. Although it fronts Nebraska, FDOT denied them access. You can see where they currently have no, a driveway. We we don't have Mr. Cotton's. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, can you share screen, please? Sorry. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. So, so what you see on the screen now, there's, there's a mirror image of the same plan to the south. So um, going to the next, going to the aerial map, um, these, this property here, is what's in question between the two, two applications. As I was saying, on Nebraska, FDOT denied access. So they have to, they're losing their, they currently have a driveway apron. FDOT is taking that away with the redevelopment. So they're actually, for, for in both cases, they're asking for access onto East North Bay Street and access onto East Ida Street. Um, right now, the property is vacant. Um, these are just photos of the site. It's the same photos in both applications. Um, existing um, commercial on um, around the property. This is across the street. This is looking down to um, from Nebraska, looking towards the interstate, going that going that direction. And um, this again is across the street, and that's the end of the slides. So. Um, Again, the only the what their what the applicant is before you tonight is to gain access onto the local local streets. Again, it was denied. FDOT denied the request, but the ZA can't approve access onto a local street that has to be done by city council through this through the petition review process. Do you have any questions for me? Any questions for the gentleman, Councilman Dinkfelder? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cotton. Would you go to the aerial of the? Uh, uh, the air, the existing. Um, am I still sharing? Okay, let me blow this up a little bit. This right here? Yeah, so uh, I've got a pretty good idea of, of what they're proposing uh, on the North Bay. So they want to come in on the North Bay side um, with effectively what sort of a, a private alley, I guess, on the back of the project. Um, and then this, and then, and then go go in or out also on Ida, right? So right. right up there on the property line. Um, so my question is immediately adjacent to uh, on the North Bay side. It looks vacant. Is that right? To the yes, right there. Um, there's there is development here. It's zoned multifamily, but I believe it's all single family residential. But what what is happening immediately adjacent on that property line? I can't I can't see it. Yeah, right, right there. Is, I don't is think it, there's any development there. I think this is vacant property. Okay, now going down to Ida, same question. Is that um, a structure? Right, right here, I think there's I think there's a residence on that property, a single family 
Brandis, the applicant will probably be able to answer the question just to confirm. Okay. And then my next question, my last question to you, Mr. Cotton, is on, especially on the Ida on the Ida side, but perhaps the whole the whole private alley. Is there going to be a fence on the site? Is there a fence on the site plan? Is there buffering required or proposed? Um, correct. Yeah. So what? This is the site what plan. They're proposing um, trees every. I think on center every forty feet, or every. I think it says every twenty feet. So they are okay. proposing landscaping in the back, and as well as I believe they're putting up a PVC fence. Okay, so that would be required uh, on both of these site plans, the north and the south. Correct, it's the same plan, just south. Right, just flipped over. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Are you hearing none? Anything else, Mr. Cotton? No, sir. All right, uh, we have uh, the applicants. They have been sworn in. If you'd like to begin your presentation. All right. uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Michael Leakes, uh, and with me this evening, I have my business partner, Charlie Thomas, uh, and then we have our, our uh, council, uh, Mr. Kelly and Mr. Thompson. So uh, first of all, we just wanna you know, thank you to council members, uh, city officials, as well as city staff. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to come before you. This has been a you know pretty long road uh, for us in this process, especially uh, in the midst of the pandemic. Uh, and we're we're really we're thankful uh, for your willingness to to bring on this forum to and continue to conduct the city's affairs. Uh, so uh, with that, I'm going to really turn it over to uh, to Mr. Thomas, and he's going to give a, a overview of what what we're doing and how we got to here. And and I think the real issue here is is not so much the uh the access as much as the zoning administrator doesn't have the ability to grant the waiver for access to the local road which kind of brings us to the review process uh both projects were conditionally approved uh and they were conditionally approved based off of the fact that the zoning administrator could not grant the waiver to the local road uh, we feel there are some compelling uh, reasons you know probably most importantly is a, a safety component, which was DOT's uh, reason for denying access to Nebraska, which we currently have access to. Uh, so uh, with that, Charlie. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Uh, quick, let me start with answering Mr. Dean Fagablu. Uh -oh. uh, Mr. Thomas, you're frozen there. Oh. The, the property at 4106 North Nebraska, directly behind there is a multifamily property that abuts us. And the property behind North Nebraska Avenue is a vacant lot. Um, as it for buffering and um, hedges, we've met all the uh, requirements of the special use one with the appropriate uh, buffering and separation between multifamily and the vacant uh, lot and have staff concurrence on that and we're open to anything that the board may feel, but we were in compliance with all of those things. Um, our, our, again, our, our real question or request for you is really just the waiver to the access. Uh, we've met with staff, we, they've been a good partner with us, with Mr. Cotton, uh, to meet all the city's requirements. We just ask that you support this petition. We believe it's in line with the safety and the real need for public realm that in that public space that we don't have driveways and it's consistent with our the city's overall um, want for pedestrian walkway, walk space and um, green space. And that's all we have. And if you have any questions. Do we have any questions for the applicants from council members? Is there anybody in the public? Do we have any public comment? Anybody registered on the line or at the convention center to speak? for this item. Remember, we uh, heard items six and eight together. We'll take two separate votes, but we already have two presentations and one, so we don't have to do this twice. Is there anybody with public comment? Michelle? No one has registered to speak live. All right, this do we have anybody at the convention center? This is Aileen Rosario for Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. 
All right. Is there anything else at this point, anything else by the applicants that they would like to say or any other questions or concerns, comments from council members? If not, I would like a motion to close the public hearing. We'll take motions from uh, from there. Councilman Goods, you have a question, sir. Yes, sir. Motion to close. Second, Mr. Second. We have a motion to close from Councilman Goods. Second from Councilman Miranda. Is there any objection? Hearing none, there is no objection. And by that, by unanimous consent, the public hearing is closed. What is the pleasure of council? If we could have two motions for six and eight, just for clarification. So the first motion would be for item six. Who would like to take that? I'll take number six, Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Chairman, I uh, move uh, item six, which is file number SU 120-49-C. Uh, I move to overturn the ZA permit, uh, the administration on the denial of the SU-1 application. The petition has demonstrated uh, that met the public standards and that based on those findings of fact, the applicant has testimony established. Um, he will not, uh, the applicant will not in any way harm public safety, general welfare of the neighborhood. All right, we have a motion, we have a second? Second. Yeah. Second, from, second from council member Goods. Let's have a roll call vote, please. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you very much. Now, may I have a motion for item number eight? Again, we've heard the presentation. Um, Councilman Goods. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, did you want to, um, Mr. Goose, did you want to uh, read the motion or? or I'll read the motion. I thought he was asking for a motion. Okay, I'll read the motion. Yes, sir. If you want to overturn or, or no, uphold. I'm over to, Mr. Chairman, I moved to overturn the zoning administrator's denial if she application uh, 20-27C because the petitioner has demonstrated that the petition meets the specific standards set forth in the section of 27-132 and the general standards set forth in section 27 dash 129A, uh, the compliance with section 27-129, the uh, use will ensure public health, safety, and general welfare if located, proposed, and developed, and operate according to the uh, plan as submitted. Second. We have a motion from Councilman Goods and a second from Councilmember Miranda. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dingfelder? Yes. Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Thank you very much. That settles item six and eight. Thank you, uh, applicants, gentlemen. Thank you very much. I had a quick, thank you. I had a quick thank question. You. Councilman Dink. I had a quick question for the gentleman before they pop out. The name of the organization, Development Support Resources LLC. Um, now that we're done with the, the, the approval and everything, is this a, a special needs uh, project uh, in terms of these 14 units or or, or is it just uh, uh, con commercial conventional housing? Yeah, it's um, it, it's fee simple, fee simple townhomes uh, that we're building there on, uh, on both projects, all, all 13 units. Okay, all right, fantastic. Um, I thought by the name of the company, I thought perhaps it was, uh, you know, special needs, but I apologize. But anyway, I think that's fantastic and um, it's a great location and good luck. Thank you. And we're, we're looking forward to it. I know that uh, we, when we were originally reaching out, we uh, noticed that it's actually on the border between Chairman Maniscalco and uh, uh, Council Member Goods. It, it literally splits your, your areas. Like, well, should we reach out to one of them like, or both of them? So thank you all for your time. You talk to one of us on one side of the street and you shout across the street to the other. So right. <laughs> thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Have a good evening. All right. We have items number seven, number nine and number 12, the, the final three items. And item number seven, um, if the applicant would turn on, okay. You have your camera on. If uh, you would raise your right hand, you'll be sworn in now. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And the clerk's office did not receive any written comments on this item. Okay. Uh, 
who would like to begin? Ms. Johnson Velez? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Susan Johnson Velez, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Um, council members, this is a review hearing for an SU1 special use permit. Um, again, for the record, an SU1 special use permit is one that has already been determined to be an allowed use if it meets the code criteria for that use that is found um, in section 27-132 for the specific use, which in this case, again, is a dwelling multifamily and single family attached, as well as the general criteria for all special use um, applications found in 27-129. This application did not meet the code criteria uh, and petitioners are here to request a waiver from you, which staff cannot approve because staff cannot grant waivers. The petition has the burden to prove they meet the criteria for the waiver, which council shall grant if the council finds that the application after granting the waiver is consistent with the applicable general standards set forth in section 27-129. This review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence upon which staff based its decision, though you must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented. I'll now turn it over to Mr. Cotton, who will present the case to you and explain the waivers that are being requested. Morning or afternoon council, evening council, sorry. I am Eric Cotton, planning and development. Um, the applicant is Palm View Villas. Thank you. Um, we're property at 2909 East Genesee Street. The request is for multifamily residential. Now the property itself is zone CI, commercial intensive. Um, similar to the previous case, it's a special use one. There's, there's two criteria you have to meet. One is you have to be able to comply with the RM24 development standards, which is slight S. The other, the other issue is having access onto a to an arterial or collector road. Um, in this case, this has three street frontages. And let me um, jump ahead past the site plan to the actual map. So this has um, access onto 38th Avenue, North 30th Street, and East Genesee. All three of those streets are local roads. So the, the property can't meet that requirement of having access onto an arterial or collector. I'm um, just going back real quick to the site plan. Um, oh, let me try that again. Going back to the site plan. Um, this is the request. It, it, it complies with the RM24 standards. Um, so just um, jumping ahead, just for looking at some photos around the property. It's a vacant piece of property. This is the view from 30th. Um, this is the view from Genesee. Um, these are just photos of surrounding property. The road dead ends into the railroad tracks, the CSX railroad tracks. Um, and then just again, surrounding properties um, in the area. Um, so again, the, the request is strictly to get, an, get, a, um, waiver from, get a waiver from city council to allow access onto an, a local local street versus having the requirements to be on an arterial or collector. As there's any questions, let me more than happy to try to answer them for you. Do we have any questions for Mr. Cotton? Hearing none, applicant. Good evening, Council. Abby Feely, Stearns Weaver Miller, 401 East Jackson Street, Suite 2100. I'm here before you tonight as the agent for Palm View Villas. And um, Eric gave a great description of our request that's before you tonight. I do have a brief presentation, uh, if I may share my screen. Go ahead. She's... Mm. Well, let me move it over. Hold on one second. I'm going to move you over. If you minimize your, your browser, it might pop up behind it. Mm. Mr. Chairman's getting pretty technical there. Mm. <laughs> See, what if you click on the item right in the center of the Gen Genesee Street? There it is. Thank you. Thanks for your patience. Okay. Still. Okay. Have 
but it's still weirding over here. Okay, I'm just gonna go through these uh, for some reason it won't go to full screen. Um, as Eric mentioned to you, this is on North 30th Street and East Genesee Street. We are in the Tampa Comprehensive Plan Central Planning District. Um, and there are two, both Genesee and 38th are both dead end streets uh, due to the CSX that runs on the Western uh, side of this property. Here the property is shown to you in blue. It is a 1.29 acre site. It is actually zone commercial intensive at this property. Um, there is two places of religious assembly immediately to the south. Um, this is, so what's interesting about the whole CI here is that you could actually put a vehicle car sales lot here and by right you would be able to access any of these three local streets. Um, but in order for us to put uh, infill housing in this location uh, through the special use process, we are required to access an arterial or a collector street, which this property does not have any, that it um, abuts it. There is residential to the north along Genesee, the two places of religious assembly I just mentioned to you, and then a series of residential uh, on the east side of 30th. Shown here for you is the zoning atlas. It does show you that CI, all of that red is CI. So the subject property plus the two churches are CI and the corridor of 30th, even though containing um, residential, some places single family residential is commercial general. Uh, there is a PD over on North Bay. I believe that is also a place of religious assembly. And then as you come down the 30th Street corridor to Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard, there is commercial intensive that picks up there. This slide also allows you to see that CSX that is um, on the western side of the property. There are the two criteria that Eric mentioned in relation to the special use standards. The site plan. Um, I think Eric may have an older version of this. This site plan acts for two or request two local street access, one on 30th and one on Genesee. I believe this is due to fire requirements for circulation on the site. We do have to have a second ingress and egress, and that is being proposed on 30th. What is being proposed on this property is 30 multifamily units. That's five buildings with six units each. Again, just to go over the local access, Genesee is a local street, 30th is a local street, and 38th is a local street. As I previously mentioned to you, the CI district allows for far more intensive uses that given this property's location would be able to access us either one of these streets by right, um, which makes it kind of odd. The other side to this is if we had zoned the property RM24, we would be allowed to access the local street by right. So it's almost um, kind of an idiosyncrasy in the code that perhaps when a property only accesses a local, um, you have to get access to your property. So it's kind of odd that more intensive uses would be allowed to get access to one of these streets by right and a lesser intensive use that's more compatible would not be able to access without a waiver. That being said, um, the North 30th Street corridor is designated community mixed use 35 and then you have the CC 35. This property is zone CI, which I just went over, which allows for more um, intensive uses which could access the local street. And lastly, the multifamily dwelling use in the zoning district, um, a typical that would be allowed in this land use could access a uh, local street by right we would respectfully request your approval this evening to overturn the decision of the zoning administrator and um, allow for access to the local street for this use. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for the petitioner? Councilman Dingfelder. Mr. Chairman, you called on me before my hand went up. Um, I, can, I can sense it. Thank I you for the comment. Melvin, Ms. Feely, um, a couple of things. Um, could you put up your slide um, about halfway through the 
it's the aerial it shows the neighbor to the i think it's to the north i'm not sure what direction it is actually but the other th oh you know i also had i do have some photos also um but i can put up the photo that the photo that would be most helpful to me is the photo of that structure that is on the other side of 30th directly across from your driveway your proposed driveway that, that's the that, Bethel church this is the Bethel church oh uh, on church. The, on on 30th right here across from the driveway well, what what is that let me let me um it is it's the garage house. and the back side of a house if you can see okay all right so you're coming out basically right around that palm tree yes it's in in that area here okay you're come and and what see my question my concern and my question is and and if and if you had still been here uh to review this application i think you'd have the same question uh as a staff member but it's not a question of does this property have a right to get out to a private street a, i mean a smaller street because clearly it does but the question is what's the best place to get out and and now if you would go to, and and one of and the reason i'm concerned about it is you now have proposed 30 units and i don't know how many trips per day that is wait 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 go back that one go back to that one go back to that the, the photograph you had right there yeah you've got 30 units coming out of that palm tree with x number of trips per day uh in and out directly across the street on a very small street with a sidewalk directly across the street from that ha that single family house now if you if you pull back and go to that slide that shows the bigger picture um not a not a photograph yeah okay but, but, but. This is us here. Yeah. To me, the better place to have come out would have been on that by the church because the church is hardly used except on Sunday, blah, blah, blah. Why not come out? Why didn't they design this thing to come out on that little used street that share that would share the use with the church? Another, you know, uh, more intensive use. I that's, believe, you know, let me go back. And that, let me let me finish and that's okay that's 30, 38 that's 38th street for the record or 38th avenue for mm -hmm. the record yeah that is because the site drains um to that side and that is when you look at our our site plan that is where the storm water retention had to be configured in order because this this is um an affordable housing workforce housing uh, product and we cannot afford to vault the stormwater that's required for this site so that has been designed in a way to balance the stormwater requirements the green space requirements the parking requirements the fire access requirements um, and the required distance separation from the intersection on 30th and then on Genesee to allow for access to the property. Well, oh, I, I, I mean, I, either of those buildings could have been reconfigured to go up on the other side where you have the retention pond number one uh, up there in the up there in the top there, uh, you know, and, and and squeeze out, squeeze that out or something or other. I, I don't know. To me, to me, if this is all about what is the best. Thing, you know what's the best way to ingress 30 units uh i don't think directly across the street from a single family house so that's just that's just my opinion do you have an engineer uh on with you today or i do not have the engineer with me tonight no i don't may i ask a question may i inquire and I apologize. Martin Shelby, City Council Attorney. Um, what specifically is the, is the, again, concisely stated the issue before Council tonight? Mr. Cotton? You want me to respond? Yes, please. Okay. 
Paracon pending the development. The issue before council tonight is access is to have access to ask for a waiver for access to people. Is it okay? So then, the, so then, then council, I believe uh, it's proper for you to look at potential adverse impacts. And if there are, as um, um, Ms. Johnson Velez stated earlier, if there are um, uh, conditions or things that need to be adjusted to be able to address adverse impacts, that's something that can be addressed. I just wanted to be clear that um, that certainly um, it has to be within the confines of, of not addressing something that's outside the scope of this particular request before council. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Freely, uh, so it became, a cost, it became a cost factor because it's deemed going to be some type of workforce housing that it wasn't vaulted. Is that that's what I understand? Yes, that was um, part of it. Th this site plan did go through the city's development review committee. It did receive approval from transportation, stormwater, um, land development, natural resources, and was ready to proceed to permitting. It it's, should have been at permitting months ago, but due to the local street access, it did need to come, it was denied, um, but there were no other waivers or any sort of relief that the project needed with the exception to the local street access. Just for the record and clarification, transportation, transportation did not, could not have approved this. I mean, they couldn't have approved it they, because it's contrary to the code. They did review the proposed access points for technical standard satisfaction to make sure they were the required distance from the intersections and where they would need to be located. Right. And if granted by council, they are in an approvable location. Okay, anything else? All right, is there public comment? Anybody registered to speak for this item? No one has registered to speak on this item. Thank you very much. Is there anybody at the Tampa Convention Center that wishes to speak? Thank you very much. All right, anything else from council members? Anything else from the applicant? May I have a motion to close the public hearing? So we have a motion closed from council member Miranda, second from council member Goods. Is there any objection? Hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. So for item number seven, what is the pleasure of council? What is the pleasure of council? To uphold or overturn the decision? Anyone? Councilman Goode. I'll go ahead and move to overturn. The zoning administrator is now of issue uh, one application uh, 20 12 because the petitioner has demonstrated that the petition meets the specific standards set forth in section 2732 and the general standards set forth uh, in uh, section 27129 uh, compliance section 27129 uh, the, the use use will ensure public health safety and general welfare if uh if located were closed and developed and operate it according to the uh, plan submitted. Second. Second from Councilman Citro. Roll call vote. Here. Yes. Question on the motion. Question oh, oh. On the motion. Here. Councilman Dinkfelder. Thank you. Um, just before, you, before the vote's taken, I, I'm looking at the site plan. The site plan makes no reference to workforce housing. The staff report makes no reference to workforce housing that I can see, um, and I'm going to be I'm going to be voting no based on the fact that that it's not that I don't believe that they can't come out on a local road because they obviously that's the only place they can come out, 
but I do believe there's a better local road in the form of, uh, well, there's a better local road than, than the location that they've chosen. But there's no guarantees that this is workforce housing. And with all due respect to my friend, Ms. Feely, um, there's just no written guarantees of that. So, you know, I, I believe her, but that doesn't mean anything legally. So thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Mr. Chairman, Council, I don't know if, I don't know if Ms. Feely can answer this question for Mr. Dinfield or not. Uh, has the city contributed anything to this type of affordable housing plan for this development or the state, or is this just a private developer that's doing this? Want to move to reopen, Mr. Chair? Then we get a motion to reopen this hearing. So moved. We have a motion from Councilman Dingfelder. Do we have a second to reopen the hearing? Second. Second from Council Member Carlson. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent. The hearing is now reopened. Go ahead. Thank you, Abby Feely. Um, Council Member Dingfelder, as, as you're aware, your code doesn't have a classification for workforce housing. And I can't put that on. It's multifamily housing, just like student housing is multifamily housing right now. I mean, that's an effort that the city is undertaking that I hope shortly will start to have some code clarification because um, many of these people don't have cars and there won't necessarily be 30 sets of, of trips that are, are coming out of the project. Um, so I don't, there, there is not even a use in the city's code right now that says workforce or affordable housing as a use category under the land development code. Um, so to make a commitment on a plan to something that isn't even in the code, that's, that's a bit hard at this, at this point. Um, that is the intention. That's the, the applicant's intention. Um, there is no funding source that's coming from the city in relation to this project. The applicant was hoping to have been out of the ground, um, you know, months ago, unfortunately, due to COVID and the hearing that was scheduled months ago that is now happening this evening. I mean, it's at their intent to move forward with permitting of this project as soon as possible and to provide 30 units within this part of the city. Councilman Goods. She answered my question when she was explaining Mr. to Mr. Dingfelder. My big question was, was there any type of funding coming from the city or any federal dollars that are being put towards this project? But she yes. alluded it's a, it is a private uh, developer, correct, Ms. Feely? That is correct, sir. Yes, sir. Councilman Dingfelder. Thank you. Um, yeah, again, Ms. Feely, I, I, I agree with you that there might not be anywhere in the code that speaks to this at this time. But you spoke to it at this time uh, to, you know, to help us make our decision. You you offered the fact that it was workforce housing. That's why the site plan couldn't be changed. The stormwater couldn't be moved, et cetera, et cetera. I just want to make sure, and Ms. Johnson, the or Mr. Shelby can confirm that that there's no guarantee about it because once we approve the special use exception, it's approved on that land. And your client could sell it tomorrow, even though he's well intended today, he could sell it tomorrow and it would just be multi multifamily approved coming out into a, you know, into a residential, um, uh, you know, residential street. So that's my only point. Um, obviously, I believe you and I don't know your client, but I believe your client and everything else. But from a legal perspective, there's nothing binding as related to workforce housing. Well, I, I, May I speak, Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir, Councilman Miranda. You know, this is a complex issue. I, I understand both sides. I'm not saying that Mr. Dinkfeld is right or wrong or that the petitioner is right or wrong. But when you start to look at what is workforce housing and affordable housing, there, there's no dollar attached to it as far as a monthly installment that you have to pay. It, it becomes a, a thing that's a very capricious and arbitrary as to what is what is the amount? Is it 800? Is it 500? Is it 1,000? Is it 1,500? So I don't really know that to be a fact. I don't think this code addresses that, or I don't know any code that addresses what affordable housing is as far as rent subsidy. I know that uh, when you go with the other, there, there's certainly that and, and different things are recording. The Tampa Housing Authority, they have a scale that you have, and they, they gauge it by that. They gauge it by the income of the person 
and what they pay and what the government's going to pay. And, and those things are set in contractual agreement with the property owners. And this is not. Uh, so we're very different and, and we're different, but we're not different. We're different because it, it's something that people say. And not only I'm not talking about this petition, I'm talking about any petition. And, and there is no no amount that says that what it should be or couldn't be. But uh, it, it's a fact that we have to sometimes, and I know you've heard me say many times, trust and verify. And, and I trust. But how do I verify this? There is no verification any way you turn on this one. None. As I see it, I may be, I may be totally wrong. But I'm, I'm just looking at the facts, and the facts are, let's find out what road. How can you have a piece of property you can't exit? That's, it becomes more and more uh, complex, and, and I'm not saying that the city is wrong in <laughs> saying what they did what, and how they looked at it. I'm not saying that petitioner is right. But somehow we have to have a meeting of the minds here, and in life, sometimes you have to take a risk. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson Velez. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Council, I just um, wanted to mention that this, again, this request is for uh, a waiver to the requirement that this type of development have access to an arterial or collector road. This development does not have access to um, an arterial or collector. And so um, in this review hearing, it is up to council to apply the general standards in section 27-129, specifically, you know, the criteria in one A1 through five um, regarding things like whether or not the, the site plan, as, as shown, will ensure that the public health, safety, and welfare is, is ensured and whether it's compatible with contiguous and surrounding properties and, and so forth, and whether it's in conformity with the comprehensive plan. And so those are the, the things that council should evaluate this request on. Mr. Shelby. Yeah, well, I think um, uh, Ms. johnson Velez articulated very well. I, unfortunately, um, was bumped out of um, uh, the webinar for a period of what generated this discussion, what initiated this discussion. But the question is, uh, it sounds like there's an issue as to whether this is going to be used for workforce housing or not. And to go back to how Ms. Johnson Velez articulated it, I think quite succinctly, um, how does workforce housing um, uh, relate to the general standards that are before you today relative to adverse impacts? And I think I agree with her uh, position as articulated, and I understand um, uh, that uh, city council um, uh, is limited to the code provisions that are um, relevant to its determination here tonight for this particular hearing on the matter that's before you. Okay. Councilman Dink. Uh, Council, Councilman Dink. Right. The, the only thing I would say in response is <clears throat> I'm not judging the project based upon workforce housing or not. Okay. That's, but Ms. Feely opened that door because she brought up the fact and she justified the site plan on, on the fact that it was workforce housing. So that's the only reason I kind of rebutted that notion that it's workforce housing because there's nothing in the petition. There's nothing on the site plan. There's nothing anywhere that says it's workforce housing. So the community can't be guaranteed that it's workforce housing. She opened the door. I was just dealing with it. But I agree with both of you, fine attorneys, that we have to look at it on the basis of whether or not we should allow this project to go out to a local road. Again, I agree that it has to go out to a local road because it doesn't have any other roads to go out to. But what I'm saying is, is it's a site plan controlled project, I assume, because they, we've been given a site plan to look at, and it's a very detailed site plan. So if it's site plan controlled, all I'm saying is that there's a better place to come out to, which is 38th Avenue, instead, of, which has no impact, except it comes out to the church parking lot, as compared to coming out with 30 units directly to the side, which faces a single family house. And that's my whole point. Therefore, I believe that the impacts are, are much greater to that single family house and to what's going on along that side, that other road. What, what is that, Genesee? Mm. Is that Genesee, Ms. Dewey? Are you proposing no. on coming out on Genesee? There are two accesses being proposed. 
One is on Genesee and one is on 30th. Okay. I thought the 30th is just a fire access. 30th is not, the one that you are raising concern about the project traffic accessing on, which is the major corridor to MLK. Okay. All right. Genesee well, anyway, is I on. I got my streets a little confused. North, I, uh, north is on the east. I had a North Bay, North Bay, 40 town, Genesee. 30th so. is on the east, 38th east. is on the south, and Genesee is on the north. Okay, so 38th All right, have, so my, my, my point is, instead of North 30th Street, that, that I could support this project if it if it was designed to come out on third on East 38th Avenue by the church, as opposed to having the impacts on that other street and coming out directly into the driveway of that single family house. That's my point. Uh, that's where I'm coming. From. Mr. Chairman, I have a question for staff. Can I inquire? Go ahead. Uh, as to this being a site plan controlled project, did this was this filed as a PD, Mr. Cotton, originally? How did it appear? How did it come before the city, the city staff? As a special use. Eric but no, I mean, but when, it was fi when it was filed, it wasn't this, this, this site plan that we have that's yes. required for this design exception. But did it come to council no. as a PD? No, it's a special use one. It was filed because yes. the special use is because the property is zoned commercial and it's a special use to make it right to do a residential development in the in the um, CI zoning district. So when council member Dingfelder says this is a site plan controlled uh, project or approval, um, the answer to that is he's correct. Is that right? It is site plan controlled. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Anything else? May I make some closing comments, please, in relation to the information that was just raised? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. The property before you tonight has a community commercial land use, which allows up to CI. It would also allow for an RM24 zoning district, which is the standards that this project has to meet under the special use. What's interesting enough is the RM24, had they done a Euclidean zoning, would not have had any restrictions to any local street at all. So it's kind of a conundrum that the code under the commercial intensive says if you want to do residential in this district you have to do it as a special use and it has to have a site plan that site plan has gone before staff it has been reviewed there was no issue raised toward the number of trips that the project would generate whether affordable housing or not nor the access points that have been proposed under the site plan that was considered by staff that being said of the three streets that surround this property, 30th actually acts more as an arterial or a collector than the other two streets, which truly are local streets. So I believe that the proposed access on 30th meets the intent of the special use, which asks that the project access an arterial or a collector. With that, I would request your approval tonight to overturn the zoning administrator. Very well. Is there anything else from council? If no, we'll ask that we close this hearing again. Can I get a motion to close? So we have a motion to close from Councilman Vieira, second from Councilman Miranda. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent, hearing no objection. We have uh, closed the public hearing. Who would like to make a motion? I don't remember who made the original motion to uphold or overturn. Goods. Good. Uh, Councilmember Goods, did you make uh, the motion? Would you still like to make a motion? I'll go ahead and make the motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we'll see where it goes. Uh, I'm going to overturn the. Uh, one sec. I'm going to overturn the zoning administrator's denial of issue and application. Uh, SU 1 2012. The petition has demonstrated that the petition meets the specific standards set forth in section 27 the general standards set forth in section 27 129A. Compliance with section 27 such as the use will ensure 
The public health safety and general welfare is located, proposed, and developed and operated according to the plan as submitted. The use is compatible with the continuous of and surrounding property. Second, Vieira. All right, we have a motion from Councilman Good, second from Councilman Vieira. Roll call vote. Vieira? Yes. Good? Yes. Dinkfelder? No. Dinkfelder? No. Manny Scalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Citro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion care with Dinkfelder voting no. Thank you very much. We have two Thank items you. to go. Thank you. Next is item number nine. Before we begin, if the applicant for item number nine would turn the camera on so we can uh, swear you in. Applicant for item number nine, please turn on your camera. Mr. Dennis, Lewis, Lewis Nutris, would say number nine, number nine. Mr. Dennis Nutris is on. Um, he just needs to turn on his video and unmute himself. Definitely mm, clutch tonight. Okay. Applicant, if you would please turn your camera on. Applicant. Mr. Chairman, may I suggest maybe perhaps skipping that number and see uh, if he can come back on and unmute okay. himself at some point in the future? Yes, sir. We will go to the final item. We will be coming back to item number nine. Item number 12. Item number 12. Petitioner, please turn on your camera and we will swear you in. Item number 12. And that would be Mr. Jenks Bowie. Item number 12. Well, how about item number nine? Item number nine, if you can hear me, please turn on your camera and we can swear you in. The petitioner for number nine is sending a message saying he's trying to turn on his camera. So we're Harry, trying to Harry, we see you now, sir. And unmute yourself. I'm sorry, I think there is some kind of miscommunication because I'm not Denis Natruskin. I am his uncle and he's on another line. He's trying to connect, but uh, uh, there is some kind of a problem with connection. He cannot connect by phone. Is he attempting to connect by phone? He's on computer, uh -huh. on uh, Apple computer. Uh, let me, let me, uh, just a second, Denis? Can uh, can you connect to uh, the city council or not? Can you call? Marty. Okay, okay, uh, sorry, just a second. Okay, let me uh, uh, try to do it myself. I don't know, <laughs> this is a very unusual situation. Okay. Um... Who are you, are you love? Yes, I am Lev Pali, but I didn't intend to speak. Well, I can I can put Dennis on the speakerphone so he can hear uh, everything. No, we have to, we have to see his face. Okay. He wants to... and, and was he sworn? He was not sworn in, and neither were you at this point. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Uh, may I disconnect? Maybe uh, this is the reason because I am connected as well because. My screen says that I am Denis Natruskin who is talking. 
So yeah. maybe I just disconnect and he will uh, he'll be uh, accessible for you. I'm very sorry about this uh, uh, technical problem. Okay. Yeah. Well, okay. Disconnect, we'll have him try and come come right back in and replace. You. Okay. Thank so you very much. My, here, I appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, before we do that, let me just be clear for the record because it looks like Mr. Natruskin is representing the owner. Did you plan to make the presentation, sir, or did Mr. Is it Pillay or Pillai? Did he present? Who's, who's going to make the presentation? Who is intended to make the presentation? Uh, Dennis wanted to make presentation. Okay. okay. And he's okay. ready to do it, except uh, this problem with the uh, connection. Let me try to disconnect, and he will try to reconnect. Okay. I'm really sorry about it. Excuse me. And I think what happened is you're both using Dennis' link. You should have registered. Yes, yes. Oh. He sent me the link. Yes. I just uh, wanted to right. listen to it. Yeah, he okay. has. Right. Hang on. Not you. Hang up, Lev. Go. Okay. I disconnect now. Thank okay. you. Okay. We'll wait a little bit. We'll wait a few seconds and let the real Dennis connect. We need to keep a uh, a log of these type of occurrences, you know, just for yeah down the road. <laughs> well, that's an interesting point, Mr. Dingfelder, and I think uh, um, uh, Ms. Lucas brings up a very interesting point. While we're taking the opportunity, so the public is aware of this, each individual speaker needs to register separately, and the public needs to know that, and that's part of the instructions because each registration is unique to that speaker. So it um, uh, requires uh, everybody to, um, uh, to log in separately if they intend to speak. Um, and uh, that allows the clerk to be able to keep track of who the speaker is, allow them to be moved up to the screen, to allow them to be sworn in for that particular hearing. So just a reminder of the public as we continue to go forward with these virtual meetings, that uh, if you intend to speak, you need a separate sign-in and a separate registration. Thank you. All right. How about those bucks? How about those bucks? That was a great game yesterday. Go Cowboys. That was a good game, too. I don't know who that is. That was a good game, too. The Rays are up one to zero, and uh, I think the Lightning play, too. Imagine if we won a World Series, the Stanley Cup, and the Super Bowl at home. Anything can happen. A lot of wishful thinking, brother. Yep. Mr. Chairman, maybe you want, want to inquire how we're doing on number uh, number 12, because whoever, whoever gets the number, first maybe wins. Is number 12 on the line so we can go ahead and go to that one? He is on the line, and there, there he is. is. All right. Uh, James, we need you to unmute yourself and we're going to swear you in. So the clerk is going to ask you to raise your right hand. Okay. Are there any other speakers, Mr. Chairman? The clerk? We have someone on the line to register to speak to for public comment. Yes. Yes. We want to have them sworn in now or when they begin to speak. How do we work that? It's just one person. We'll wait till they begin to speak and then we'll. Okay. Please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And the clerk's office did receive written comments on this item and one registered counsel for this item. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, uh, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Council members, this is a review hearing for a design exception one. Um, an alternative design exception, which is which allows minor deviations from the strict strict application of the land development code subject to the limitations described in the code. The criteria that staff applies when evaluating an alternative design exception are found in section 27-60 E5 of your land development code. Staff did not find in this case that the requested fence um, met the alternative design exception criteria. And so um, this review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence upon which staff based its decision. 
Council must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence presented. And again, Council may impose reasonable conditions upon the design exception to ensure that the public health, safety, and general welfare are protected and substantial justice is done if it is Council's pleasure to approve the design exception and overturn the staff's decision. Following the presentation of the evidence, Council may either uphold the decision or overturn the decision and impose reasonable conditions. I will now uh, turn it over to Mr. Cotton for presentation of the staff report. Good evening, Council, Eric Cotton. Can I yeah, thank you. Go ahead, sir. Um, this is DE1-2031. Um, the applicant is James Bowie um, for property at 1501 East Mulberry Drive and the request is to increase the height of a fence in the front yard from three feet to six feet. Um, property zone RS50 per section 27290.1, the maximum height for a fence in the residential zoning districts, um, such as RS50, is three feet if it's a solid fence and four feet if it's a like a wrought iron or a chain link. Um, the zoning administrator denied the request as this is a 100% increase in the allowable height. Um, this is the site plan in question. This is again on the river. The fence is along the front yard. And I'll just go to a quick aerial. Um, this is Mulberry, the river um, across the street from Seminole Heights. Again, this is the an increase in the height from three feet to six feet. Here's a picture of the fence. And it's in the corresponding metal gate. And um, this is the next door neighbor's fence. This is probably at three feet. Maybe this is probably at three feet. And um, this is just a pictures of the surrounding properties. This is what's adjacent to the site. And um, photos of property across the street, looking down Mulberry, looking down Mulberry the other direction going down to the south. Um, again, the request is to increase the height of a fence in the front yard. So the fence that you see on the screen, oh, I just lost myself, I apologize. So the fence you see on the screen, um, the height limitation for that fence is normally three feet. The applicant applied for it to make it six feet and staff denied the request. Okay. Thank you very much. Any questions for Mr. Cotton? I do, I do have a question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Eric, why, why is this a, uh, a design exception as opposed to a variance? A, a, a variance request, yeah. Um, per 27-60, um, through a tech, through a, a code amendment a couple of years ago, fences are now the purview of the zoning administrator to make the determination whether the height increase is appropriate or not. So that's uh, a couple of years ago would have been a variance. Now it's a design exception. But you don't have the ability to waive, to waive that requirement on the front yard, right? No, we do. Staff does have the ability to increase the height of a fence in the front yard. Um, that's a very big change. And I don't want to cloud council's version view of what this proposal is, but the request to increase to allow a fence to go from three feet to six feet. Um, he has a, a gate across the front, but the request is to also he could he could put a solid fence across the front yard i don't know if that's at a planning site is that something the city council wants to see theoretically on every house that's up and down every block of the city so we we venture very difficultly those are difficult decisions and staff tends to err on the side of a denial and let city council make that decision because that's, a, that's going to become a policy decision eventually if every person wants to have a six foot tall fence uh, one other follow-up question. Um, so we're looking at two different, two different things. Well, three different things that are six feet. On the right side is a six-foot fence. On the left side is a six-foot fence, and in the middle is a six-foot gate. Um, are you under code? Are you allowed to have a six-foot gate? No, that would be a separate. That would also be um, an increase in the height. So when staff looked at this, we took the greatest request which is the three feet to six feet for a um, for a chain link fence or a wrought iron fence, the increase would be from four feet to six feet. 
Okay, but to answer my question, you're not allowed to have a six foot gate either, correct? Yeah, no, sir. The maximum height is three feet for solid, four feet for like a wrought iron or a picket or a chain link. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Hearing none, uh, applicant, if you would like to speak. Oh, yes, I do. No, no, that's, okay. that's me. Oh. Go ahead. Um, yeah. Uh, there has been several uh, occasions where I have bricks in, trespass, trespassing, and uh, goods have stolen off my property. Having six feet high, uh, fence height would create privacy and decrease the incident of any trespassing. Since I have the fence installed, I'm happy to say that there wouldn't have been any issue. Um, I would, I did submit like um, the police report that uh, I got broken in uh, several times. My car got broken in, man. My lawnmower was got stolen, things like that. So that, that's that, that's why I put the fence in, on there to keep myself safe, my family safe. And then also, if you guys could bring up my my neighbor, it's uh, Eddie Key. He could uh, speak on my behalf. Is that the registered uh, speaker that we have, clerk? Yes, I believe so. Okay, uh, once we get him on the line to speak, he will have to be sworn in. Mr. Chairman. Okay. Yes, Councilman Goods. Let me ask Mr. Cotton a question. Mm. Yes, sir. When I drive down most residents, I see six foot fences along the side. So are you saying for that particular area, a six foot fence is not allowed in that particular area? No, in the front yard, Eric Cotton Planning and Development, in the front yard, the maximum height for a fence is either three feet solid or four feet if it's wrought iron, so air and light can flow through it. Um, for example, on a corner yard, the height can be six feet, but in the front yard, it's limited to either three or four. Front yard, three or four? Yes, sir. So on, on a corner lot, for instance, the narrowest portion of the property is considered the front. That's where the height limitation would be applied. Going back, let's say RS50, going back 20 feet, at that point, even though it's on a street, if it's the corner yard, it doesn't create a side obstruction, the, the height could, could pop up to six feet till the rear yard. Okay, all right. Okay. Anything else? Councilman Dinkfeld. Yes. You're muted, sir. Nobody can hear me. Mr. Bowie, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay. My question, um, and, and I see on your on your application, you speak to four different incidents in, de in great detail. And the police report seems to indicate at least two incidents, uh, at least two separate incidents that you reported to TPD. Yes. Um, they, they came back for some supplemental information, but I see two, I see two different case numbers, I think. Um, but my question to you, sir, is the whole city has a three foot limit on the front yard and a four foot, if, if you, if you use something that's transparent, like a wrought iron, you can go to four feet. Have you tried a, a four foot wrought iron fence? or a four foot gate? Um, or did you just jump to the six feet? Because obviously you put it up and then you probably got sighted or something. I don't know. Yes, uh, yes, I just put it up and I got sighted. Uh, I did not know the right. code and things like that. I just tried to protect right. my family because after one incident, no, I, understand. After one incident. I, I, understand. I understand that and I'm not criticizing you about knowing the code and we're all learning the code to some extent every day. I'm not criticizing you on that. Mistakes happen. But the, my question is, is, is prior to putting up the six feet, did you try the, the four feet? What, what was there when, when these burglaries and break-ins happened, what was there? Was anything there to prevent people from coming and going? There was not, uh, before that, that incident started, there was no, no, nothing. There was not, no fence or anything like that. So the, all right, so, so that went from nothing to six feet. Yes, that's yes, I did. 
is it physically, is it possible if we deny this, could you cut down the fence to, uh, to three feet and cut down the wrought iron to four feet, the gate? Uh, to, to be honest you, yes, I could do it, but it doesn't, uh, I mean, stop people from jumping off the gate. Three feet is not okay. good, just to be honest. All right, I, I understand. Three, three feet is a lot for this old man. But I understand what you're saying. But you you seen the picture that I upload and stuff that you you seen guys that they, they tall and big and stuff like that, you know. So you know it's no problem at all for them. Especially I'm on a slope, so that you know it's real easy for them to get jump over the fence. Therefore, that's why all I right. went for the six. Thank you, sir. All right. Any other questions, Councilman Goose? Yes, sir. Looking off the sheet here, you're on the back section of Mulberry down the by the river. Yes. Thank you. All right. You had a, well, we had someone that was going to speak that was registered for public comment. Once that individual does appear, we have to swear that person in. Okay. And then also if you, uh, I don't know if you guys can see like, uh, I got like signature of uh, neighbors and stuff like that. Support me keeping that six feet the best. Uh, they don't have any proposal against it and things like that. Please right. raise your right hand. Mr. Keene, raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I can read some notes, and I'd like to share my screen later if y'all don't mind, okay? You have uh, Mr. Shelby, can he be part of the petitioner, or is he part of the public comment? I'm for support of the Partitioner. Now, Mr. Shelby, does he get three minutes or can he have more? You're muted, sir. Oh, sorry. No, 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 you, Mr. Shelby is muted. If, if Mr. Buey says he's part of the petition, how much time does he have remaining? Do you know? I don't believe, I believe, I believe he, I believe he's not part of necessarily the presentation. I believe he's a person speaking in support. Is he? A, I believe he's, he appears to be. He's a neighbor in support. Okay. Well, I, think this, I think the skate park guy had over forty minutes. Well, sir, um, uh, the chair, the, sir, did you want Mr. Chairman? Did you want to address that, or did you want me to address that? Uh, just go ahead, Mr. Keene. I'll start the clock. Okay. All right. I'll read my brief comments, then I'd like to show you a couple pictures, okay? All right. I, as I stated, I'm here in to present and to support James and Tao for this fence. I am the adjacent property just to the left of the picture that the city proposed or, or presented, right? And I too have had petty break-ins, okay? Now, when I get to it, you will see that there is no backyard for any of these houses along this section of the river. When they were built back in the 50s and 60s, they were built down on the river, okay? So there is no backyard. All right, this is a young couple that is getting their lives and the careers on task via work, school, so they told 60 hours a day. It's a young Vietnamese couple. They just moved into the neighborhood in 2015. They bought this from a son that that aired the property from his father, all right? And since then, that property has drastically changed, all right? And for the police and security issue, as far as why they want the lower fence or the wrought iron gate, or chain link fence, okay? You can see their entire front yard through that current gate that's on his driveway, right? Now, James and Tao have come into this neighborhood as a young Vietnamese couple, only Asian couple in this neighborhood. And they have went out and they've helped local neighbors, elderly, they have worked with me, as well and they they are just becoming part of the community as you can see if you look back at the city surveys 
or, or pictures and the ones I will show you with the overhead, there are no sidewalks on this street. Okay, so everybody walks down the street or walks through the yards, including the mischievous <laughs> young kids and such. Okay, if you look across the river in Old Seminole Heights, also known as River Heights, they have sidewalks. Okay, and most of those are fenced down the front, but those are set more up on the street, like Park Circle, and they have rear yards. Okay. Property values in Ferncliff. Matter of fact, this section that James and I live in is called Ferncliff. People know it as Sulphur Springs, but it is Ferncliff. There's actually a park at the corner of Hannah's World that is deeded for the Ferncliff residents. Right? right? Our property values are 40 to 190K. Okay. Across the river, directly across the river from Mrs. Bowie, Mr. Bowie. The, the property over there is sell right for sale right now, okay, for four hundred thousand dollars. So only thing that we are asking is let the new property owners clean up to increase their property values and protect their property. Now, Mr. Chairman, if you don't mind, if you could share my screen, I can show you a couple things that I know he sent in. He and I walked around with all the neighbors, okay. That not all the neighbors, but most of the neighbors, especially the ones in Ferncliff, and asked if they opposed this fence. Okay. None did not, none opposed this fence. All the ones we spoke with approved it. And they signed the list that he had with the folio numbers on their folio numbers to approve this fence as is. So if you would, wouldn't mind, let me share my screen. That would be great. And I can show you air, overhead view of such all right if you can share his screen am i sharing not yet it should load any second okay we can see it now go ahead sorry right. that's mr you see my my finger right yes all right that's mr Bowie's property now I noticed Okay, the street is up here. All right, this is his roof line to right here. This is my property. This is my roof line. I may have, may have 15 feet of yard at this end. Over here is about eight. He has six, maybe. Okay. All right. So he has this property here that he wants to fence in. Now, understand this gentleman. They're, they're young and they're going to have kids. Oh, sorry. I just lost it. Sorry. Let me get back to something else. You there? Yes. Yeah. We can see right. the, the overhead. All right. Can you see the screen now with all the uh, yellow? yellow? Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. These here are all people. The yellow is, is tenants, or not tenants, but owners, owners, not tenants, owners that have signed his petition to keep his fence as is, okay? The rentals gave me a verbal agreement because they couldn't sign off on it. They aren't the property owner. We got a verbal here. Now, this one was T. Blue. He plays blues sax throughout the city of Tampa he agreed to it but but uh it was a phone call okay this is a daycare right here these people signed off so all these people signed off on to keeping his fence as is this red mark line right here is the fence in question okay all right so so that's what I'm leading up to. I mean, I can't see why he would not be allowed to, to keep this fence, to secure his property, secure his future family, okay? But because he has no rear yard for his future family to play in, okay? And th that's what I have to say. Thank you Thanks, for your time. Sir. Do we have any other speakers that are registered for public comment? I had a question for Mr. Chairman.
Thank you very Any much. Thank you, Mr. Keene. Yes. Okay. Uh, two things. Number one is I'm looking at the photograph that staff provided us. It says adjacent property. Um, and I see a yellow house with a basketball court in front and two cars, two white cars yes. or white silver. Is that your house? Yes, Mr. Dingfield, it is. Okay. And, and coming off the side of your house is a white PVC fence, but it's, it doesn't start It's six feet tall. It protects your backyard. It protects your side yard, but it doesn't come out anywhere near toward the front street. Correct. And I agree with that. And, and the reason right, we did. So, okay, go wait, ahead. Wait, Mr. Wait. Okay. All right. So, and when I look at your next door neighbor's house, I see the same thing. I don't see anybody. I see everybody with a, with a big front yard and I don't see anybody with a, a fence. Now, you don't, you don't have any fence between you and the, your front door and all the way to the street. That's correct. Uh, correct. I mean, I have some decorative fences in there, but correct. So, and, th and then on the other side of, of the petitioner, Mr. Bowie, they have a three, a three foot fe wood fence. It was previously a six foot fence and they did not want to go through this process. So they cut it down. Okay. So they I got can show you a picture. And they cut I can show you a picture where it was there if you want to see it. And so, so my, my point earlier and, and now is we, the city understands that people want to protect their front yards. But but all across the city, it's it's three feet. So his children could play within a three foot fence front yard, or even a four foot fence front yard that's that's wrought iron. But all across the city, we the city enforces this because otherwise we'd have we drive up and down the streets of all across the city, and we'd see six foot fences. And I'm not sure that that's what the city wants wants to look at. But anyway, thank you, Mr. Keen. I, I hear you, you're a good neighbor, you're a good friend, you're a good person, but I, I just can't agree with the logic, so thank well, you. Well, but every piece of property is not the same layout. He has no rear yard. I do not have a rear yard. I'm a grandfather. I don't have kids that live there permanently. They come over for a few hours, thank God they do. I homeschooled them for three and a half months early in the spring, okay? But, but, they do not have a backyard. That's the purpose of this hearing is so you hear the individual cases that are different to the city overall rule, law, ordinance. Thank you very much. Do you have anybody else for public comment at this time? Anybody clerk? No, we don't have anybody to speak on this item. Do we have anybody at the convention center? This is Eileen Rosario with Planning and Development, and there's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. All right. Are there any questions or other comments from council members? Is there anything else from uh, Mr. Bowie? Ms. Sir, do you have anything else to add at this point? No. All right. Thank you very much. Is there anybody that would like to make a motion to close this public hearing? We have a motion closed from Councilman Miranda. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Second from Councilman Vieira. Is there any objection? Hearing none, by unanimous consent and without any objection, the hearing is now closed. What is the pleasure of council for item number 12? Anybody? If not, I'll pass the gavel. Anybody? If not, I'll pass the gavel. Councilman Cedro, I'll pass the gavel to you and make the motion. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to uh, make a motion to overturn the decision uh, made by the zoning administrator for file number DE1 20 31 C because the petitioner has provided um, substantial evidence and reasoning as to why it should be overturned as well as um, quite a bit of support from the neighborhood and whatnot. And um, the fact that, you know, each case we take is different and it's a case by case basis and considering the circumstances and the layout of the lot, uh, that is my motion. 
Second. There's been a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Yes. Goods? Yes. Big Felder? No. Big Felder? No. No. Yes. yes. Carlson? Yes. Dietro? Yes. And Miranda? Yes. Motion carry with Ding Felder voting no. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I pass the gavel back to you. Uh, if you'd like to, I'm just going to step out for, for a minute. If you want to continue back to number last item, and I'll be right back. Thank you very much. Do we have the petitioner on the phone now for item agenda number nine? Mr. Boone, your item passed. Thank you. Appreciate it. Do we have the petitioner on the line for item agenda number nine? This is Dennis and I'm on the line. Where's the video? I believe we need to have your video, please. Somebody's got a video playing. You can hear an uh, echo of sound. It's, uh, it's, I guess it's getting me one second. Let me see. It says open system preferences for the camera to allow to sharing. Open system preferences for the camera to allow to sharing. Okay. Share my webcam. I mean, can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but we cannot see you. Saying something, some preferences not allow me. To there you go. It's, it's left. Yeah, it's my it's my uncle. Okay. We still need your your camera. Do you have separate sign-ins now? Yeah, he has a different uh, yeah, name. Separate. Yeah, I, I sent him the link before. Uh, I guess the link he used, and that allows him to log in. But then uh, I signed out. I signed back in. It let me sign in, and it's let me use my voice, but it don't let me turn my camera on. Yeah. I'm logged in as Lev Pale now, so I'm not Denis Natruskin anymore. Very good. Who's going to be making the presentation, and do you both intend to testify? I didn't intend to. I thought Dennis was set up for it. Hmm. But uh, are you able to if you had to? Yes. I am. I apologize for my outfit because I just wanted to watch. It's okay. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to make sure that he does that willingly. I don't want him to be prejudiced in any sort of way if he doesn't feel that he'd rather have Mr. Uh, Anatruskin represent him. If you're uncomfortable, we can always continue this to another date if that comes to it. But if if you are comfortable, uh, you you are in, in, because you are the owner and you uh, would like to do the presentation, that's up to you. Or we can continue it or however you wish. We want you to be... 100% uh, comfortable. Chair, I would like to also add that we have TNI staff reaching out to Dennis, so if you could give them a couple of minutes. Yeah. All right, we'll 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 wait then a few minutes. This is our last item of the night, and TNI is going to try and, and figure this out, um, and we'll go from there. No, we can, yeah, we can talk. They can hear us. It's just, it's the, it's the camera. It's something with the security and privacy settings on my Mac. Okay. That don't allow me to turn the camera on. Yeah. We have to see you. That's the only thing. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I understand that. I have to swear. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, we can uh, we could turn if if the staff can turn off the video for Mr. Pillai until we resolve the issues, and perhaps you might want to do new business if you want. Otherwise, All we right, can let's, just let's do that. We'll turn off your the video for Mr. Pillai for the time being, and then we'll go to new business, uh, okay. and we'll get that out of the way, and we'll go back. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank okay. you very much. So now that we're in new business, let me go. Let me go first, and the reason is. Um, I sent a memo out, or my aide sent a memo out regarding the um, expiration of the uh, governor's emergency order where we're able to meet totally virtual. Um, we anticipate the expiration at the end of this month and of course going into October. Uh, I don't want to wait to the last minute. The, le the legal department doesn't want to wait till the last minute as to how we proceed uh, moving forward in uh, October. I'm going to pull up. We sent out the memo, but I'll read it here. This is just a suggestion um, and how we, um, you know, how we move forward. Um, City Council resumes in person quorums at the Tampa Convention Center, meaning a minimum of four people. Uh, City Councilor, uh, City Council members not present at the Convention Center will participate virtually on video. So you'll stay as is if you're one of the three not participating the public, the applicant, and any interested parties as well as staff would participate virtually. This means this is not a regular meeting that's open to the public that will flood a room full of people. Number one, this will apply to evening meetings and with morning meetings continuing as audio only with video PowerPoint presentation unless city council directs otherwise in the motion. It will remain in effect until December 1st, 2020. Hopefully things change for the better where we can meet in full in-person meetings unless the circumstances change. Uh, from a public health perspective, as we remain in a state of emergency due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I have sent this out uh, as a formal uh, memo, um, but I've read it to you word for word as it states. Um, that's just my suggestion, unless anybody has anything other to add or change, but that beginning October 1st, unless the governor extends the emergency order, which then we stay as we have video and audio, as you see, but should that not happen, that we be ready to, uh, have the four person quorum minimum at the convention center, which is already set up. I of course will be there for the in-person meeting. So if there are three other council members that promise and can guarantee they will be there and perhaps an alternate um, in case somebody is not able to show up. Um, that's that's what I'm suggesting. And if anybody else has anything to add. Mr. Chair, if I may, if you're asking to uh, have volunteers for that will be there, I will yeah. volunteer. All right, anybody else? Carlson? Um, I'm happy to volunteer. All right, Mr. Um, Muir. Yeah, I mean, schedule uh, notwithstanding, um, uh, yeah. I can obviously volunteer as a, All right. as a general rule. I have no problem with that. Right. Councilman Miranda. Sir? Mr. Miranda. Yes? Would you like to be one of the volunteers for uh, the in-person uh, um, quorum that we need? There's no, I've been doing it all along. Okay, so we have uh, five council members here. How about you, Councilman Dingfelder? Would you like to come in person and be that part of the quorum there? I think it depends on what the numbers are on that given day. Okay. Um, right now, the numbers are heading in a good direction, and I'm glad to see it. And if the numbers consider, continue to go down that way, then I'll be glad to join you. If right, the numbers go back, if the numbers right. go back up, then I will reconsider. All right, Councilman Goods. Uh, I see the position in a week and a half, and I'll let you know the answer. All right, so, but we have our, our minimum four person quorum. Now, remember, this is not open to the public. We won't have, uh, it'll be, you know, virtual and whatnot. And, um, oh, yeah. you know, so it's, it's going to be. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood it, but okay, all right. So it would be closed doors at the convention center. Four of us would be sitting on the dais. We'll have some staff and attorneys, minimal. 
uh, and then everybody else will be participating virtually as you see here. So that is to keep the uh, social distancing and health protocols, so safety protocols in place where we're not being reckless. Um, Mr. Shelby, would I need to make a, a formal motion to, to accept that? If you pass the gavel and you intend that to be made, um, uh, that's uh, your prerogative if you wish to ask somebody else if they wish to make that motion based on your memo. I'm happy because I've sent the memo out to council members and other individuals have been CC'd. Everybody from John Bennett to Sue Ling to Gina Grimes to everybody. Lots of attorneys and and, and the who's who. So I will uh, then pass the gavel to uh, council member Citro, Chair Pro Tem Citro. Yes, sir. All right, then I'd like to make a motion that we go with, as stated in the memo, option three, um, which means that city council will resume in-person quorums at the Tampa Convention Center. This is if the governor does not extend the uh, order at the end of this month, but in anticipation that he does not, uh, it would be beginning October 1st, which we do have a meeting, four council members, which we've already reached that quorum, would meet at the convention center and the rest would participate virtually via video. The public applicants, interested parties and staff would participate virtually on video so they would not be there in the room with us. Um, this would apply to evening meetings and with morning meetings continuing as audio only with video PowerPoint presentation. And Mr. Chairman, if I may address that for purposes of discussion, um, I did have an opportunity to speak with Ms. Wells and um, Ms. Zellman this morning, uh, excuse me, right before this meeting started at, at uh, five o'clock. I uh, want to confirm that once that expires, the executive order, um, that um, uh, council can, can, can continue to have the morning meetings in video. If there is a legal issue with regard to that, we will certainly bring that to council's attention and advise you. But uh, as of now, it depends on what council's pleasure is. If council members definitely want to go video tonight, they can certainly make it in the morning, that is, they can certainly make that as part of the motion. Otherwise, you can keep things exact, exactly as they are in the morning. But if legally things should change, we'll have to advise you of that. Okay, however, if in the, in the case the governor does extend this, yes, anything can happen, then we will just, it will just be business as usual as we have been doing so far. But if that's council's intention, that's clear as part of your motion. Okay, but you know, we have this prepared, you know, so we, we anticipate October 1st back, you know, to, to the motion that I'm making. However, if the governor extends it, then we just stay as we are. And that's my motion. Understood. Is there a second to Councilman Maniscalco's motion? Um, second. Motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Vieira. Any discussion? Roll call for the please. Pierre? Yes. Woods? Yes. Dinkfelder? Yes. Manny Skako? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Dietro? Yes. Miranda? Yes. Motion carry unanimously. Mr. Chair, Thank you, Council. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, the rest of new business. Councilman Vieira, do you have anything? Absolutely nothing. Thank you, sir. Council member Goods, do you have anything for new business? Uh, not tonight, sir. Thank you. Council member Dinkfelder, do you have anything, sir? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd say in about 60 to 90 days, I'd like to get a, a, a report from staff at our, at our regular uh, council meetings about uh, fences, and specifically uh, corner fences and front yard fences. Um, I think there, there seemed to be some confusion um, about that issue and also about staff. Uh, it was news to me from the that said staff is now able to waive that requirement. I didn't realize the code had been changed. So I'd like, uh, I'd like staff to give us an update on, on the code, on the ability of staff to waive um, those provisions on the benefit of uh, of lower fences in the front yard. Um, is January okay? Park. Is January okay? Because we have Christmas and Thanksgiving and Hanukkah and everything in between. So 
Jan January fine. There's no there's no rush, but I think right. we just need to get some clarification on where we're at on uh, Friday. What do we, Friday. What do we have in January? I know the 21st is a CRA meeting. What uh, what is the nearest uh, regular council meeting for that under staff report? Um, Mr. Shelby, do you have that in front of you? You're muted. I'm sorry, sir. The question again was my apologies. Um, what in January is our, is our regular uh, council meeting? I think it's at the January 14th. January 14th, sir. All right. It's January 2021. Is that okay, Councilman Dingfield? Okay. That'd be great. Thank you, Mr. We have a motion from Councilman Dingfield. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilmember Goods. Is there any objection to the motion? Hearing none, without objection, unanimous consent, the motion passes for uh, staff report January 14th, uh, 2021. Anything else, Councilman Dingfelder? No, thank you. All right, Councilman Carlson, do you have anything, sir? Uh, yeah, just quickly, um, uh, I, I don't think anybody's done this, if, if you have, I apologize, but I, I think we should do a commendation for Jack Harrison's 50th anniversary on air. Has anybody done that yet? No. Um, so I would make a motion that we that we uh, provide a commendation. I can deliver it, or if, if you all want to go with me, Dan, or we can ask him if he wants to come on one day. I second. All right. We have a motion from Councilman Carlson, second from my Councilman Citra. Do we have any objection to the motion? Hearing none, by unanimous consent, the motion passes. Thank you very much, sir. Anything else? No? Councilman Citro. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councilman uh, Carlson, when you go, please let me know. I wouldn't mind accompanying you. Okay, and anybody else let me know. And congratulations and thank you to Jack for all everything he's done. Uh, Mr. Chair, nothing more than go Bulls. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Councilmember Ryan, do you have anything, sir? Councilmember Miranda, do you have any new business, sir? Yes, sir. I, I was uh, just writing out some notes and uh, talking about some hearings. I try to learn something every day I come here and listen to these hearings. Uh, when you see fences that are put up, homes are bought, and immediately, usually they're not built that way. They're just a lot with everything open, but somebody sells the house, and next thing you know, there's a complete vinyl plastic fence from the property line all the way down to the backyard, all the way across the property line, back up to the front of the house. And you can't see what's in the backyard. No one can look in, no one can look out. And I'm afraid that for public safety, we ought to have some slats in the front of the house where at least the police department, if it was an incident, they can see what they're looking into without going in. Uh, and I think it's a public safety thing that we should look at. Uh, there's in my neighborhood, every time a house is sold in 15 seconds, the next thing you see is a vinyl plastic fence, either white or beige, and you can't see in the backyard. Mm. These things should be dangerous to anyone. And and I'm looking at the gates up front, and I understand that was a special case, but when you drive by a house, you talk about public safety, I can, at, at 80, I can still jump a four foot fence. I had a six foot letter. But these things have to be recognized. And I want to know why we have certain guidelines that you got to have a four foot fence in the front yard. No, I'm not talking about the side fence, the gate. Uh, you can have a plastic fence and have a four foot and they still jump it. I understand that whoever wants to get in and we make it more appeasing, they're going to get in. And, mm. and uh, but I, I like to put this on the January 14th why we have to have a six, not a six foot fence up front, and why we can allow plastic fences without anyone looking in the backyard, without anyone seeing who's there, or for whatever reason, I'm not trying to spy on no neighbor, mm. but I want safety for the police officers also, and the public at the same time. If you're going somewhere and you can't see where you're going into, you got a problem. All right. Do you want to do you want to mix that in with Councilman Dingfelder's report about yes. fence? Like the police department, maybe they have a take on this, and I haven't spoken to anyone in the PD. Okay. Um, then we'll have a motion to that effect that we have a fence discussion there under staff reports, as Dingfelder and Councilman Miranda brought up, so we can touch on all the bases. 
Councilmember Miranda has a motion. Is there a second? Here. Second from Councilman Vieira. Is there any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent, the motion passes. And that settles new business. Back to item number nine. Is Dennis uh, now uh, able to appear by video? Okay, uh, I'm here like, uh, okay, left. It's, it's letting you do it and don't let me okay. do it. Okay, would it be okay if I make presentation instead? If you are comfortable with doing that, then we can go ahead and do the presentation. If you are comfortable. Yes. With, okay, uh, please raise your right hand. The clerk is gonna swear you in before you uh, yes, begin. Michael's gonna present. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Firm, you would tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. And the clerk's office did not receive any writing comments on this item. Thank you very much. Ms. Johnson Velez. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Susan Johnson Velez, Senior Assistant City Attorney. Council members, this is a review hearing for a design exception one pursuant to Land Development Code Section 27 60. An alternative design exception allows minor deviations from the strict application of land development code subject to the limitations described in the code. The cr criteria that staff applies when evaluating the alternative design exception and which council will apply this evening are found in section 27-60E5. The petitioner has the burden um, of proving that they meet the criteria for uh, the granting of a design exception. This review hearing is de novo, which means that you are not limited in your review to the information, documentation, or evidence that upon which staff based its decision. You must apply the criteria in the code to the evidence pre presented and council may impose reasonable conditions upon the design exception to ensure that the public health, safety, and general welfare are protected and substantial justice is done. Following the presentation, staff, uh, council may either uphold the staff's denial or overturn the denial. Should it be your pleasure to overturn the denial, you may impose reasonable conditions. And I will now turn it over to Mr. Cotton to present the case to you and explain the request. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. Cotton. Good evening, Council Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. Um, this is a, a petition for re review for DE 120-106. The applicant is Dennis Natruskin. For property at 3609 North 53rd Street. Um, there are three requests the applicant's asking for. Property zoned RM16, which is residential multifamily, and the proposed use was a residential um, semi detached, which is uh, side by side, mostly normally called a duplex. Um, so it was asking for a waiver of parking spaces and a waiver to some of the East Tampa overlay district requirements. So um, 27240, subsection E1E. Um, states that the vehicular edge of a of an entrance to a garage, carport, or other vehicle storage should not be constructed to the to the um, closer to the street than the front of the principal structure. Let me go to the um, site plan. And then um, the other request is that no driveway shall be constructed to the front of the property. So in this case, the applicant's asking to put four parking spaces um, for the two units to terminate at the front of the structure, which is not allowed under East Tampa. Additionally, because of the two units, he's required to have one guest parking space, which he was also asking to waive. Um, the urban design staff reviewed the request, determined that there was a possibility that he could provide parking in the rear of the structure um, by offsetting it down to five feet and then having a you know, roughly nine foot drive aisle towards the back that would be able to provide parking in the rear. Um, so urban design denied the request. Um, this is an aerial of the property. It's on 53rd surrounded by, um, and then the zoning is RM16. It looks, I believe the majority of the, of the properties up and down this area on his side of the street are single family across the street. There are some duplexes or single family, semi-detached, um, a picture of his property after the rain. Um, this is the property to the North. Um, this is the property across the street, which is a single family home with a with a one car garage. And that's the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer the questions for you. Any questions for Mr. Cotton? Okay. 
Thank you very much. Sure. I'm, I'm sorry. I was muted. I, I apologize. Uh, Mr. Cotton, with the reasoning for the uh, for the denial was because the uh, cars that may have been parked in those parking spaces be infringing upon the right of way? No, sir. The parking was going to be off the public right of way. The East Tampa has specific requirements that were adopted back in 1980, um, excuse me, back in 2000 when the council adopted the East Tampa standards. Some of those requirements were um, you can't park in front of the structure unless you're going into a garage. And so that was one of the requests. So that was that was one of the basis basis is for the denial, was they don't meet the requirements of the East Tampa Overland. Okay, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Cotton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. All right, sir, uh, Lev, you are now up. Go ahead, sir. Uh, okay, so how do I share a screen? I have presentation for you. All right, it's gonna load in a second. Okay. We could share the screen. Can you see it? Not yet. Madam Clerk, does he need some assistance or is it something that needs to be done at, at your end? What needs to be done? Well, I gave him the presenter rights and he just had to accept it when the little box pops up. So I'll try again. Hold on. You just have to hit accept once the uh, box pops up. So it should pop up right now. Do you see it? Okay. Just hit accept and then it'll activate the screen. Okay, so just uh, file or... Okay, just a second. Here we go. Okay, can you see it now? It should load now. Uh, give it a second. There, now we can see it. Yes, sir, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> So like uh, Eric said, uh, we've been trying to uh, ask for a waiver uh, to uh, put <clears throat> additional uh, a parking spot and also not to put the parking in the back of the duplex, but uh, to allow us to do it uh, <clears throat> uh, from the street in the front yard. And uh, that's how most of the duplexes in the Grand Park are built. Uh, there are very few that there are none basically that have a parking in the backyard just a second okay so this is denis natruskin whom you cannot see uh, because of the technical difficulties but uh, he is uh, the property manager and he just uh, does his work with five duplexes and one a single family home this is the Grand Park area, and uh, uh, as Eric already said, it is zoned RM16. So it is specifically zoned for uh, multifamily units, for duplexes. But over the past, uh, say, 15 years, uh, practically none of the duplexes were built in the area, only single family houses. And it's because the requirements, uh, uh, I, I think, are kind of stringent. So this is the difference between what we proposed in the red. Uh, this is just the parking for four cars uh, in front of the duplex. And uh, what, the, uh, uh, what, the, what we were required to do is to put the parking in the backyard. As you can see, it would cover a large part of the lot and also uh, will deprive the tenants uh, of the backyard where they could have barbecue or have a good time with their children. So uh, this will be just one uh, area covered in asphalt and that's it. Um, so all the neighbors are supportive of uh, Dennis's request or our requests. 
and uh, the alternatives we've discussed uh, since May uh, looked uh, much worse what uh, we suggest as a waiver. Uh, one of the alternatives was uh, to build uh, a garage uh, for the duplex, but then there will be uh, two garages for one car each, and then there will be still two cars uh, or three cars uh, in front of the duplex, so it doesn't change much. Uh, another uh, alternative was to uh, another alternative was uh, <clears throat> ah, another requirement was that uh, uh, we cannot build a garage because uh, supposedly there is a storm water management requirement that uh, 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 makes us to raise uh, the building a little bit above the ground. So the rules are somewhat conflicting, and we know that. Uh, if the duplex is allowed to build in this area, uh, there should be some kind of a waiver for uh, the area of the Grand Park. And the waiver we ask you to make, uh, to give us, is just uh, to keep it simple and keep this red area as a parking in front. Um, so I think I've made most of these arguments. Okay. Uh, and that's uh, the summary of the presentation. Uh, so we asked the city council to uh, help us pass through the apparent dead end. And uh, we've tried our best to be constructive and to find the solution. But uh, as we see it, there is no way uh, for us to build a duplex there. So if you don't grant us a waiver, then uh, there will be no duplex on this lot. And, uh, uh, the alternative would be only a single family house, which are being built uh, in the Grand Park. Uh, thank you very much for your attention, and I apologize once again for these technical difficulties. Uh, I enjoyed listening to the whole uh, City Council meeting. Uh, it's for the first time for me, but uh, I found a lot of interesting information in it, uh, and I do appreciate the hard work you do during the coronavirus. Uh, by the way, we've applied for uh, the City Council meeting uh, back in May, and we had to wait uh, until now, I assume, as many other people. So uh, your offer was very generous to delay it a little bit more, <laughs> but uh, we are kind of desperate uh, for uh, an answer, and uh, it would be very helpful if you could help us out here. Thank you. Thank you very much, and we appreciate that that you appreciate the city council meetings are very, very exciting. Any other uh, questions for the applicant? Anything at all for the gentleman? Mr. Mr. Maniscalco, you're make, making us laugh here tonight. Yes, sir. Um, Do you have any questions? Yeah, I did. Um, I'm looking at the staff report. It says the lot is 50 by 112 and the side yards are being reduced to seven feet. This is um, one of the basis for the denial by the zoning administration. It says the property could have been designed to provide parking in the rear. And uh, Dennis, uh, Eric, you're, you still hold to that? Eric Cotton, Planning and Development. Yes, the parking could still, I mean, the property could still be divided. I understand the applicant's point of taking away usable backyard, but there, I mean, the request is to put a proper a building that goes from setback to setback, smack in the middle of the property, pro back in the middle of the property, did not show any kind of design alternative to try to, try to re requirements of the parking and try to meet the requirements of, of um, these type of overlay. And that's why urban design denied the request. Okay. And um, uh, Mr. Mr. Pillai, um, you heard you heard this comment, or maybe you've seen this comment from staff. I think they're they're indicating that it's possible to do the duplex, but still, but put the cars in the rear. And, and why exactly would you, would you not want to do that? Well, <clears throat> one of the reasons 
is that it would cover a large part of the lot uh, just uh, you know as a driveway and a parking place so there will be no backyard at all for tenants it would be much less uh, convenient and attractive uh, option uh, to live there this is one argument but another one is that since may we've uh, tried to reach out uh, to administrator and uh, we proposed to do the parking in the back for five cars. We offered them a plan, but they said it would be uh, too much of the area covered and uh, that it is not feasible uh, for this particular lot. So we did uh, offer to put the parking in the, uh, in the back of the uh, duplex, but uh, uh, the reaction was not positive, as I understand it. I'm sorry, Mr. Cotton, do you have any response on that? I'm sorry. I, I don't, I think they may have spoken to um, Urban Design. They haven't spoken to me about it. I think they spoke to Mike Callahan about mm -hmm. the request. I don't recall ever having a discussion over the, over the design well, of having the property, um, the, the parking in the rear and having too much clock coverage through that process. Uh, if we could go back to my presentation, I can show you there are copies of the letters from the uh, from uh, <clears throat> the administrator. So, he, so they said there was too much pervious, too much impervious surface. Yeah. Well, that too. But uh, let me just uh, show you this letter. Okay. Uh, this is about uh, the garage. So this site is not the best for a duplex as you are paving the majority of the site. That's what uh, they answered us. And uh, that's when we proposed to put the parking in the back of the uh, duplex. I take it there's no garages, is that correct? Excuse me? No garage? No garage, no. Uh, most of the duplexes there, they don't have garage. Uh, it's just uh, people who live in these duplexes, uh, they are mostly concerned about good living conditions, maintenance, and uh, having some privacy in the backyard. But uh, such a parking in the back would deprive them of these options. Thank you. All right. Any other council members with questions at this time? Hearing none, do we have anybody from the public that wishes to speak, is registered to speak, or is at the convention center? No one has registered to speak on this item. I leave the study of planning and development. There's no one here to speak on this item. Thank you. Very good. Any other questions or comments from council members? May I have a motion to close? I'll move, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay, motion from Councilman Miranda with the second from Councilman uh, Carlson. Any objection? Hearing no objection and by unanimous consent, the hearing is now closed. What is the pleasure of Council? The lightning are up three to zero. What is the pleasure of Council? <laughs> You're right. That ain't true. It's three, they're all three zero. It's only been like 10 minutes. Really? Oh, wow. Magic. What is the pleasure of council? Uh, if, if you make a motion, we can go home. If there is no motion, then we wait. If not, I'm gonna pass the gavel and make the motion myself. All right, Councilman Seifert. Yes, Councilman Maniscalco, you wish to make a motion? Uh, yes, sir. On item number nine, file number DE1-20-106-C, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, overturn the decision of the zoning administrator and approve the, uh, the applicant's request um, by the presentation by the gentleman um, and the documents and everything that he stated, uh, I believe there's competent and substantial evidence in supporting his claim and reason to approve this 
request, therefore overturning the zoning administrator's request. Do I have a second to Councilman Matt Scott's uh, motion? Second. There's been a motion made by Councilman Maniscalco, seconded by Councilman Goods. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, roll call vote, please. Vieira? Yes. Goods? Yes. Dinkfelder? Uh, Dinkfelder? Yes. Uh, Maniscalco? Yes. Carlson? Yes. Petro? Yes. In Miranda. No. Motion carry with Miranda voting no. All righty. Thank you very much, sir. Your uh, application was approved. Thank you very much. Again, I appreciate uh, all your work and the time devoted to these issues. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Thank you. You all too. Right. We have done new business, so there's nothing left. Mr. Chairman, are you on video? I'm just curious. I think I might have lost you. Oh. Can you see me now? Okay. Yes, thank you. That completes the agenda for this evening. We've done new business, so we've settled that. Can I get a motion to receive and we'll, follow all we'll documents? Receive and follow, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Motion from Councilman Miranda, second from Councilmember Goods. Any objection? Hearing none by unanimous consent without any objection. We have uh, received and followed documents. We are adjourned. Thank you. Have a good evening. Go Lightning. Thanks.